All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Select Board and Wage and Personnel Board um, meeting on Monday, August 26th at 5.30 here at the Lakeville Police Station. Lake Cam is recording this event. Um, is anybody in the audience recording? Seeing none. All right, I'd like to ask everybody to please rise in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, joining us at the table this evening, we have Tracy Craig McGee, our executive assistant to the select board and town administrator. We have Leah Fabian, Brenna Donahue, myself, Lorraine Carboni, Maureen Candido, Brian Day, and our interim town administrator, Bob Lewis. All right, so first up, uh, just go through a few uh, select board announcements. So early voting for September 3rd primary will be taking place at the Lakeville Public Library beginning on Saturday, August 24th from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. and August 26th through August 29th from 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. and again on August 30th from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. All this information can be found on the town clerk's um, webpage as well. Um, so if you need to refer back to that. Uh, the primary voting place will be at Loon Fun Lodge at Ted Williams Camp, which is 28 Precinct Street on September 3rd from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. We still have a few vacancies, um, although we did receive a lot of um, interest. We have a, a position on the Cemetery Commission, Energy Advisory and Parks Commission. So if you are interested, please submit your letter of interest. And a quick fun fact, Theodore Roosevelt did visit Lakeville at one point. Yep, on multiple occasions um, to enjoy the scenic and uh, beauty and fishing spots offered by its lakes and ponds. A little tidbit there. Anybody else from the select board have anything they'd like to add to the announcements? All right, hearing none, um, turn this over to Mr. Nunes. Thank you. Um, several items. Uh, I've had several meetings with the chairman of the board of assessors, RRG, uh, Munis consultant, uh, representatives from the Department of Revenue. Um, so we have decided, and I shouldn't say decided, but uh, RRG working with Munis, um, they have determined that they will be able to make the preliminary adjustments, abatements um, on the preliminary bills. Uh, so the affected, impacted property owners will be notified sometime next week uh, in time for the second quarter payment. So um, the chairman of the board is here. I don't know if you have any questions in regard to that, but uh, it took a lot of work, a lot of discussions, and uh, so we'll be moving forward with that. It appears that the Department of Revenue uh, is satisfied with that uh, solution. It is basically what they recommended. So. Uh, and the second uh, issue is uh, last week, uh, the building commission and I had a, a very good meeting with Rhino, the developers of uh, Rhino, Cap Rhino Capital, developers of 43 Main Street and uh, Taunton Water. And so we're talking, we talked about uh, the water needs for that development. Uh, they are well, the Rhino is now aware of what needs to be done. They'll be working on that and then they'll be working with Taunton Water uh, before they submit the application to the select board. So, uh, so that's good. And that is basically it. Does anybody have anything for Mr. Nunes? Um, I just have a bunch of questions. Okay. So I'll give you a call tomorrow on okay. just different things like the COA hours and okay. just. Okay. Yeah. Are you, Brian? Anything? No, good. Okay. Thank you, Bob. All right. Um, we have a set of minutes to approve this evening. Um, everybody get a chance to look at them. They're August 12th. Yeah. All right. I'll entertain a motion for approval. Um, I. Oh, do you want to do the motion or do you want to? You no, know, we can do a motion then we, when we get to discussion. Okay. 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 So, motion to approve. Second. Motion to second discussion. 
Um, so under the, let me see here where it is. The unregistered vehicle complaint. So that's page three. Um, I believe it was in two places. I might have done it wrong too, Tracy. So vehicles, uh, the second to last paragraph where it says um, the end of the second line, vehicles and ungraded, it should mm. be ungaraged. Yeah. And then I think it's the same way. I'm yes, I saw it there too. Yeah. 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 There's a second place where it, I think then when we actually get to the motion on page five. So that should say ungaraged. Um, I think that was it for me. Anybody else? All right. Uh, roll call, please. Baby and I. Tony Hugh, aye. Carboni, aye. And Hugh, aye. Three, aye. All right. We have a hearing at 5:45, so I'm going to jump down and, and try to conduct a few more things here. Um, why don't we go down to number nine? Would you be ready, um, Chief Perkins? Okay, come on up. Okay, so this discussion is um, uh, discuss some possible vote regarding the implementation of a uh, civilian traffic control personnel. So I'd like to <laughs> ask you if you wouldn't mind. This is the first. Same, this one. Um, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, <clears throat> we've always had uh, uh, problems filling uh, details uh, when a company works a construction detail or there's something out on the roadway, they have to get uh, a police officer out there to assist uh, directing traffic. Um, usually, you know, we've filled those details either with part time reserve or special police officers. Um, or out of town detail officers if we can't staff it ourselves. Um, over the past three years with the police reform, um, they've decertified six of our part time police officers for not having the appropriate amount of training. Um, so we've kind of had a larger problem. This just isn't a problem in Lakeville, it's happening across the state. Um, Taunton, Middleborough, Freetown, they've all started uh, civilian traffic. Uh, programs. So I'm looking to do the same. Okay. So what um what change I guess administratively um needs to take place in order for this to um so it, I gave you the policy and the job description mm -hmm. which would allow us to um hire per diem employees who meet the specified qualifications to be able to work um under the conditions they would fall under the police department. Um, and they would be called um, in specific order on a rotating list. Um, I'd be able to get those six people who have had, who've worked details for us in the past, I'd get those, those people back so they could work details. Um, and then I would probably add up to four more, I think. And is there any um, question regarding like insurance? Are they covered under the same policy? So the, Right now, the, the sworn, this is where Post wants to keep this, like if you read the policy and the job description, there is a clear difference between a police officer working out there and a civilian working out there. Police officers are sworn. These people are not sworn employees, so they're civilians, and they'll be, they're not going to have any clothing that makes them look like police officers or anything. It will be clearly traffic. They'll be in a different uniform. Um, and they're not covered under the same type of insurance that police officers and sworn employees are uh, that's covered by law, you know, injured on duty, 111F and stuff like that if they're injured. So they would be covered under workman's compensation. So that's something that the town already has for its regular employees. And I talked to Lacey today, I asked her the specific question. There would be no additional cost for this year for adding uh, additional employees. I don't know what the cost would be for for adding, you know, to the employee role. I, it's probably within a certain uh, number of employees, but there's no additional cost to do it mid-year right now. Anybody else from the board have any questions? Um, just because I can't remember, can can you give me the wording for post? 
police. What it stands for? Yeah. Peace Officers Standards and Training. entertain a motion uh, to approve the police chief's um, request um, to implement a civilian traffic control personnel policy. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Um, just a question. So in the case like this past weekend where we had the road race, the triathlon, how many detailed out of 19 positions, seven went unfilled. So okay. that's, you know, that's, but that would be a service charge. So when we, like, for example, the triathlon that just happened, they, they come in, they're allowed to uh, work on the road. Um, we've, we tried to fill all the positions um, and we couldn't do it. We couldn't staff them all. And then each position that, you know, the town does get a, an administrative fee for each per personnel that we put out there. Um, so that's uncaptured fees that we, we didn't, we didn't do. But they can fill though. Every, it doesn't just have to be road work. They can do every same thing, not any other detail. Correct. As far as when it comes to directing, tra directing traffic, yeah. um, bicycles and pedestrians. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Anybody else? Young girls, please. Uh, BB and I. Tony, who I? Carboni, I. Can't do that one. Okay. <coughs> yeah. Right. Well, thank you, Chief. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair. Yes. Um, you, the motion was for the policy. Do you have to approve the job description to approve the job description as well? Um, cool. As wage and personnel board? Well, we can. Probably. Just for the, for yeah. the record, then. Sorry. All right, I'll entertain a motion to approve the. Um, Job description for the civilian traffic controller. So moved. Second. Second. Discussion. Hearing none. Bull. Baby and I. Donahue, I. Carboni, I. Thank you, Lord. We are covered. Thank you. Could I ask who made and seconded the motion? Maureen, ten. Maureen, I'm sorry. Leah made I them. Did. Maureen seconded. Yeah. Both of them? Yeah, she got me. Thank you. All right, I have three minutes. Um, all right, number 11. This request comes in every annually uh, from our Lakeville Arts Council to place signage for the 2024 Arts and Music Festival. The, they would like to place the sign um, at the intersection of Precinct and uh, Route 79 one week prior to October 5th. And the banner at the top of Dickren, Darren, I always mess this up, Dickren Dyard Square on September 30th. Okay. Um, I make a motion we approve the placement of the sign at the intersection of Precinct Street and Route 79 one week prior to October 5th and the banner at the top of Dickron Dyron Square on September 30th. <laughs> second. <laughs> motion and a second. Did discussion? Hearing okay. none, roll please. Baby and I. Donahue, I. Carboni, I. Thank you, Dora. All right, I have two minutes. Um, let's see. Well, how was everybody's weekend? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, I really don't want to jump into anything else. I just have another minute, so. Um, we will be moving on to agenda item number five. I'll talk really slow. Um, so this will be a hearing um, scheduled to adopt the layout of Jillian Drive. Um, this is something that the select board needs to do, um, hold our hearing. Um, from here, once um, there's a vote taken, this would then move to uh, town meeting for town meeting vote for approval and acceptance. So it's part of the process. So at 545, I will now, um, let's see, I think the motion's in here, right, Tracy? Um, you know what I left out is um, a motion to open the hearing. All right, then I'll do that here. All right, 
45. I'll entertain a motion um, to open the select board um, town of Lakeville acting pursuant to general law, chapter 82, sections 21 to 24, deeming that common convenience and necessity require the layout as townway of Jillian Drive and intending to acquire easements necessary for such layout, hereby lays out the hereafter described Jillian Drive as a public townway. The boundaries of said by hereby laid out are as follows. The roadway layout plan, Jillian Drive is a residential subdivision off Jamie's Way in Lakeville, Massachusetts, dated March 3rd, 2023, prepared by Zenith Land Surveyors, LLC, on file with the select board and the town clerk's offices. Said plan being hereby adopted as part of this order and attached here to as Exhibit A, all land lying within the above described boundaries is hereby laid out as a town way. The aforementioned layout plans are hereby forwarded to the town clerk for filing and for going layout is hereby reported to the town for acceptance. Um, the public notice um, was posted and the town clerk had received this, it looks like on August 1st. Um, the abutters were notified. Um, we have a proof that that information was included. And is there anybody here this evening um, to speak to? You need to do a vote. Oh yeah, we have to vote. We have to do a second a motion. Okay, a second so that. so I had a so I, yeah so so, so moved. Then <laughs> <laughs> I like second. Second. Right. Roll please, baby and I. Donahue aye. Carboni aye. Can't you do it? Yeah. All right, so last year, is anybody here to speak to this road acceptance? Okay, does the board have any questions? Um, I do have the questions. Are these, I don't know if anyone else um, is wondering about these punch list items that couldn't be addressed. Um, it says the subsurface stormwater infiltration chamber system near the intersection of Jillian Drive and Jamie's Way had several feet of standing water, so it was not possible to check the system for any sedimentation. Narrow strip of eroded disturbed mulch still existed along the frontage of lot one. And then I guess this one here, uh, the double catch basin on the west side of Jillian Drive opposite of Holly Hill Lane had a six inch pipe actively discharging water into the catch basin at the time of the site observation. This pipe does not appear on any of the approved plans or as built. Does it matter prior to that? Yep, oh, I was just going to say, it? I was just looking at the date. Yeah, so the, it, um, thank you oh, for okay. putting that oh, I'm I meant sorry. to, okay, I meant I to totally say something. That. Um, so um, we did have um, a peer review go out and review. Um, for um, approved, you know, for acceptance, um, and this is what uh, Ms. Fabian was just um, referencing. We also received um, a notice from our DPW director, Frankly Moniz, um, and it said that the three final observations in the letter have been um, addressed by the developer, um, and based on the completion of the peer review, the DPW does give a recommendation of, of approval for acceptance of this road. My mistake, sorry I didn't see that, but I am still curious why there's a pipe there that was never on any plans, but I will follow that up myself. Um, there's also a letter in here, um, July 30th from the planning board. Um, they had discussed this at their June 13th meeting and they reviewed the materials um, that the select board had provided them for the layout. And after the discussion, they voted unanimously to send the letter recommending approval. So if there's nobody else speaking to this, I guess we can close the hearing and then... And then we have our own discussion. And then we have our own, yep. All right, I'll entertain a motion um, to close the hearing at 549. So, so moved. Second. All right, roll please. Baby and I. Tony Hugh, aye. Carboni, aye. <coughs> Either way. Do you Okay, and select the discussion. So I would entertain um, a motion to adopt the layout and submit the necessary uh, warrant article for acceptance at town meeting, special town meeting, which I believe we voted for November 12th, if I remember correctly. 
so moved. Okay, second. Great. Brian, did you have discussion? Yeah, so um, this follows up, I think, what I mentioned. Um, I forget the date that we last spoke about this, but I really feel like the town shouldn't be in the business of adopting roads that are approaching a dozen years old. Um, that's basically getting a road that's already gone through a healthy amount of its lifetime. I'm very happy to see these punch lists corrected. I'm happy to see the as built corrected so they're at least with the standards the DPW uh, requires, which is what their recommendation is based upon. Uh, but I really don't see why the town is not, if the town truly wants to adopt these things, we should be doing it much earlier in the lifetime. I don't feel the, the minimal chapter 90 money we're gonna get from this is really gonna offset any repairs down the road. And, and if I can just add to that, anytime we add care and custody onto anything, it means our DPW goes out and they're cutting the lawns. Um, our DPW goes out and they're sanding and, and, uh, and plowing. So it's an additional cost to the town. Is there anything in here? Because I know we had some, we have some developers that ended up having like a care and custody type of fund. I haven't seen anything. Yeah. I haven't I seen have anything here represented. No kind this. of bond or anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't know if we as a board at some point would like to entertain having that on an, an agenda and maybe a town meeting that any roadways that we're taking care and custody of, that we have something as, a, as, as some type of bond for major issues or or destruction of roadway or any of those things. Something. I think we should absolutely put something like that together for future agenda. See if we can wrap something around that. Well, I mean, I'm just curious because this was supposed to come up at least, I thought, in 2021, and it didn't. And then it was supposed to come back in 2022, and it didn't. So, you know, I guess that's my, my question is um, when the planning board approves these, I don't know if they can say something to that effect, like, you know, we don't want to be adopting roads that are 12 years old. Um, but I was, I'm just really curious because I thought this should have come forward and I don't know what the holdup was all that time. Mm -hmm. you, do you know what I mean? It's like, was it something that is problematic going forward? So, is there anyone here to speak to it? How would that work if they chose to sell their house? Would whoever bought the house be buying, um, <laughs> be buying into that? Like if they purchased the house, they would now need to maintain that road? It, it can work different ways. Um, sometimes there's an HOA that you pay into that takes care of it. Um, like Clark Shores and other areas in town are all private roads, so they'll mm. hire their own mm -hmm. plowers and people um, throughout the season. So yeah, they, there's a lot of precedents in town. In fact, is, it's a scary how many roads actually are private in town. Yeah, they have like their own associations mm -hmm. where- Usually they're yeah, small too. They're, yeah. they're thin, thinner roads without um, yeah. sidewalks. And, and they stuff. like hire their own, um, you know, snow removal in the winter and- How many houses are on Jillian Drive? A handful. Four or five? Mm -hmm. That's many. They just built three new ones. Three new. Okay. There, it, so there used to be like some sort of like cut and dry rules like if it wasn't a town approved or town road town accepted road school buses couldn't go but all that's like changed now with you know but that was like one reason why you would want it to be a town road so that way school bus you know the school down. bus could go down but now right. with all the school rules and whatever if a kid needs to get picked up it doesn't matter um but you know up till now, I guess they've been taking care of their own plowing and fixing of the road. I mean, if, if the satellite imagery is accurate, to answer your question, I'm seeing one, two, three, four homes. Technically, one is on Holly Hill Lane, but looks like four homes total. Yeah. According to the assessment, there are seven houses that have frontage on Jillian Drive. Three are brand new. It might not be there yeah. then. Yeah. One's on the corner, so it has frontage on Jamie's yeah. way and Jillian, but the driveway's on Jamie's. It's actually, there's two corner lots. 
think those are Jamie's. Those are both Jamie's. And I mean, it still is a vote at town meeting whether it gets right. accepted yep. or not. Right. So. All right, so any further discussion? Hearing none, roll please. Baby and I. Donnie, who I? Carboni, I. Baby, no. Do you get that, Tracy? That rhymes. Yes, Mr. I ask almost all of you to speak up. This room, oh, yes. this room is the worst. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> that will be on a future. Actually, yeah. Actually, yeah. <laughs> right here, Bob. <laughs> Bob, nobody asked me to speak up. That's not. <laughs> I'm going to laugh. That is something that the select board, um, I'm hoping, will we'll bring to a future meeting is, is to work on our audio, I believe. Um, I, I know residents have reached out to me about meeting audio. I mean, if you're watching from home, obviously the microphones are picking it up. But when you're here in the audience, um, even town meeting, I've had some um, comments that it's very difficult for people to hear. So. And from over here, they project this way. Instead of that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we are um, expecting our uh, town council to come, and I think that there's some folks in the audience that are um, interested in hearing um, some of the updates. She's here. Oh, she is here. We'll, we'll let her get settled first. Hello, Ms. Quessel. Why don't you come on and join us? Yeah. No waiting policy. No, this is not right no, in. No, you, your, your timing is impeccable. Um, I know we did say six o'clock, but it's not a, a hearing. But um, so, thank you for joining us tonight. Oh, yeah. Good to see nice you. Nice to see everyone. <laughs> um, so, we at previous select board meetings um, had a discussion about. Uh, you know, some questions around some, you know, 40B mitigation, and then um, with the new ADU, which is the accessory um, dwelling units. Um, we wanted to invite you here um, to talk about that a little bit so we have a better understanding as to our role um, in both of those situations and, you know, shedding some light and, you know, being available to, for us to field some, some questions. Mm -hmm. so, yep. um, so the first one was the um, 40B uh, project mitigation. Um, so generally, uh, when a 40B project does come in, I know that's under the comprehensive permit that's overseen by uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals. Correct. correct? Um, and then I believe um, Ms. Fabian um, had asked um, a little bit more in-depth questions, and I certainly you know, haven't had the exposure. Um, I Nice. <laughs> um, that's a good entry. Yeah. My son changed my ringtone, and I don't know how to change it back. So, uh, I apologize for that. I'm very, very sorry. sorry. Oh, that's great. Yeah. It could be much worse. Yeah. <laughs> so, as a, a 40B project is, um, you know, brought to the table, at what point um, would there be a discussion? Um, if you could talk to us a little bit about sure. that. Sure. So um, under the um, comprehensive permit, which is general laws, chapter 40B, sections you know, t uh, 19 to 23, um, a applicant can file for a comprehensive permit application where they file with the Zoning Board of Appeals. The Zoning Board of Appeals then steps into the shoes of every other local board. So, and they are, they are able to waive any local regulations, meaning the Conservation Commission wetland local bylaw, not the state act, but the local bylaw. They can waive subdivision regulations. They can waive um, Board of Health local regulations. And so um, the best, so there's, there is also a, um, under, the, under the EOHLC guidance, there is something called a local initiative project, which is called a LIP. And that is essentially, um, that's a technical term for a friendly 40B. And with a friendly 40B, the applicant will approach the select board prior to filing with the um, Zoning Board of Appeals. They will ask for your cooperation in entering into a LIP. And with that, what you will do is you will sign on to the comprehensive permit application. 
The benefit that that gives the developer is that on the developer gets a lot of technical assistance from HLC. The benefit that that gives the town is that the town and the developer, meaning the select board and the developer, can negotiate some mitigation. And it's usually mitigation that cannot be negotiated by the Zoning Board of Appeals. The Zoning Board of Appeals is very limited in what they can negotiate. Really, they have very little negotiation power. They can put out, they can say to the applicant, hey, we'd love to see X, Y, Z. And if the applicant you know, agrees, then great, they can make that a condition. But they are pretty limited. So with a LIP application, if the board wants to entertain a LIP, you would enter into a land development agreement with the applicant prior to the applicant filing for the LIP, um, filing the application with the Zoning Board of Appeals. And um, we have done that in other communities. We've done it for, um, for example, we've done it for sewer, um, for a sewer extension. We've done it for roadway improvements. Um, we did it in one, um, one community for, um, to enhance um, the town's recreation capabilities, um, and we've done it for uh, the developer agreed to, uh, in one other project, the developer agreed to put in a trail system that would be open to the public. Um, and so, so those, you know, those are, that's mitigation that we really can't get out of um, the developer from the Zoning Board of Appeals. The other thing that a land, a land, um, a land, um, development agreement is a contract. It's essentially a contract between the select board and the developer, and therefore, you know, you have rights to enforce that contract. Um, they also have rights to enforce the contract, but, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a lo it's more beneficial when there's major infrastructure issues at stake. Um, I can tell you that um, infrastructure improvements can happen with the Zoning Board of Appeals, and sometimes have to happen with the Zoning Board of Appeals. For example, um, when we get a traffic report that indicates that a, a um, intersection will go from, say, LOS, which is level of service B, to level of service D, they could be required to mitigate a certain intersection because they're going to make it that much worse. Unfortunately, what we are constantly up against is we're constantly up against level of service intersections that are already at F. <laughs> and so there's no F minus, there's nothing past F. So, um, you know, we, we tried our best to work with developers to have them improve those intersections as part of the zoning board's um, purview, but it is more difficult. So any mitigation that the town is going to try and get from a developer, the sooner the better is essentially, that's a very short, it's my long, long answer. The short, the short answer is it's the earlier the better. Um, to find out, you know, to approach a developer. So, for example, as you know, when a developer applies for a project eligibility letter from a subsidizing agency, um, the town and the, the select board is notified that that project eligibility letter is under review. That's when you would approach the developer and say, hey, listen, here's the mitigation that we're looking for. We would be willing to enter into a, a lip if it is if it is a friendly 40B. If it's a 40B that will benefit the town, um, then you know I, I would suggest that you enter into a lip. Um, but again, that's completely up to you. They don't have. They can still apply to the ZBA without the lip. Uh, what exactly does lip stand for? Local initiative project. Thank you. Madam Chair, I had a question. Yes. Um, through this process and the mitigation, uh, would we also be able to ask for closing dates for phases, meaning phases have an absolute end date and that they cannot go on in perpetuity? Um, that is, um, so yes, yes, that you that could be, that would be up to the Zoning Board of Appeal. You could put that in your land, your land development agreement, definitely. Um, and that could also be enforced by the Zoning Board of Appeals in their actual decision. Um, it most likely, the only, um, the only thing that I would see, so, so unfortunately the regulations require that the, per, the permit is good for three years. They have to substantially act on the permit within three years. So that means that technically under the regulations, under 760 CMR 56, which are the 40B regulations, a developer can wait 
two years and 364 days and then put a shovel on the ground. And then as long as that they're putting that shovel on the ground and they're consistently working, they're still covered under their permit. So they're covered under their permit and does the permit specifically call out the phases of the permit to be active and clo or closed? It should, um, it should. And um, unfortunately, if your first decision for the permit did not you know, necessarily call out these things, um, it's more difficult to do it on the backside yep. of that. Um, and so, you know, when you're faced with a project that's, um, you know, coming in as, you know, over 300 units in phases, um, I don't think I've ever seen, um, I don't think I've ever seen a project with, you know, more than three phases or even it's six possibly. Six is not, is not very common and the other problem that you have with phasing is that the subsequent pro um, phases do change mm -hmm. and they change for, you know, every, a whole bunch of things, All the market yeah. rates, mm -hmm. um, even environmental you know, conditions because exactly. it's a different area. Yeah, et exactly. Yeah. I think that's food for thought for everyone that that should really be part and parcel of what we're asking for, for any type of 40 B development that comes in town is to ensure that where it, it doesn't go on in perpetuity. Brian, is it uh, Yeah, so I think with regards to phasing, it, it sounds like the kind of thing that I like to put in contracts, but then unless there's a performance penalty of what kind, what are you really holding them to? Right. You probably can't just say project's done, leave it there. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if there'd have to be some kind of agreement on if you don't do this, you lose something else. Because I think ultimately we're all concerned that at the end of the day, that if CBA, who has the final say, were to say, well, we're not going to issue the permit because of X, Y, Z. They go to the state, and then the state says, well, we're going to give you the permit. Now you have no mitigation. Definitely. So, like, it's hard to figure out where is that balancing right. period where everybody's right. getting kind of getting a bit of the, what they want. Right. So that is the that is the issue that um, probably one of the hardest things that the ZBA has to go through is that they are constantly being told to deny a project. And if they do deny a project, the state will grant the project with no conditions. So your ZBA does a very good job in trying to get the best project possible through conditions. Um, you know, and the problem that they would have with the with the phasing and conditioning each phase at a, with a certain time period would be the regulations that give them three years to start. And then once they start, they can just keep continuing the construction. So it is it is problematic. Follow-up question, if I may. Mm -hmm. Do you do you, the other thing I find difficult to figure out is when we get that letter early on, we don't necessarily yet know what the impact is going to be. We have a rough idea, yeah. but we might not know exactly what infrastructure or things we might be interested in. Do you ever see towns try to put a a dollar value on these things of some kind so that builders come in and say, well, I know I want to put in 500 units, so 500 times X is roughly what the town is going to be looking for. Similar to a business that comes in and says, do I want to do business in Carver or Lakeville? Well, Lakeville's tax rate is half as much, so I'm going to look at them better um, to give them a level of certainty. No. no. The, I don't see, I don't ever see the uh, uh -huh. any kind of cost analysis. We are not allowed to look at, um, we're not allowed to look at any pro financial pro formas unless the board is about to impose a condition that would make the project uneconomic. And then once they allege that, we can then go into the pro forma phase, okay. which unfortunately never happens because the conditions are not imposed until the decision is issued. Oh. It's way down the line. It's, the regulations are just very developer friendly. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, um, you know, traffic is one of the big things, and that's my biggest concern is, you know, traffic being affected. We had to cut our budget last year by a lot, so we don't, you know, have all this excess money to, you know, be having to work on roads. So that's like one of the things that, um, and traffic studies and everything else support, you know, that information that we could, let's say, ask a developer to, you know, help pay the cost of fixing the road if that means making like you said a second lane or whatever it is um, that's pretty easy for me to understand I guess my question is what other types of you know literally what other types of mitigation 
question, is there, I mean, you know, we know our schools will be impacted, but, you know, we can't necessarily say, we think where our school's gonna be impacted, so can you buy us a couple school buses, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, so, and for me, like I said, the road work, that's very intuitive. I can, you know, I'm gonna have to change this. It's gonna require construction. Mm -hmm. We can see it, we can support it, you know, but just other, other than that, um, it is it is very difficult. I agree because um, with regard to so, for example, when 40B comes into the Zoning Board of Appeals, the first thing the ZBA does is they get a peer review. So they get an engineering firm that works for them. It's paid for by the applicant, but they work for the ZBA. And oftentimes, peer review will tell us what needs to be fixed. So most of it is traffic because there are intersections that need to be improved. Um, other than that, we're, we're, we're really trying to, you know, for lack of a better term, cut a deal with the developer to make the project the best it can be. So that's where things like walking trails come in, um, more open space for the residents of the development, more recreation components in, in the project for the, for the, um, for the you know, residents of the project, um, things like sidewalks in the development. Um, we, there is a HAC, a Housing Appeals Committee case that says that we cannot require sidewalks outside of the development, unfortunately. Um, that was, you know, it, it was a, a condition that a ZBA put on a project and um, that was, that was um, stricken down. So, um, yeah, so, so really um, through peer review and through zoning board members knowing the area, knowing what's going on, we can sometimes get creative mitigation, but um, but it is, it's hard. Jeff, are you any successful water or sewer mitigation? So I've, I've gotten water uh, mitigation through a land development agreement, um, you know, that limited, it limited the, um, it, it required a sewer extension and limited the amount of hookups, which then was a, we were able to then control the density of the project because usually that is the biggest thing when a 40B comes in and they, they're proposing 300 units. That, that is the most shocking thing for everybody. And so um, it's always good to be able to reduce density, you know, in, in a reducing density within the purview of 40B, which would be, you know, in that case, environmental or sewer hookups. And so we were able to do that. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, kind of the inverse of the earlier question on phasing. Can you come to an agreement through ZBA and the developer to say, we appreciate it, you're coming in here with 200 units, we would appreciate it, let's, apartment building wouldn't work because it's all one building, but if it's smaller townhouses and such, you know, we'd appreciate it if you would not develop more than X a year so that that impact is not just bam in like one or two years, but kind of phased in a bit over four or five years you could do that with the agreement of the developer um, the issue with that is that you don't get the affordable units put on the, st um, the subsidized housing inventory mm -hmm. at the same time so you're not yeah so you're, you're not moving at a good clip towards your 10 percent right we'll they, are, they do come in per phase though correct right. they do come in per phase and so however what happens is is that um, units are constantly being put on, taken on, put on the SHI and taken off the SHI. So once the comprehensive permit, say for phase three, is approved, all of the units go on the SHI. All of the affordable units will go on the SHI. They're on the SHI for 12 months. A building permit has to be pulled within 12 months. If the building permit is not pulled within 12 months, they all come off your SHI. If, they, if a building permit is pulled within 12 months, they stay on the SHI for 18 months and a certificate of occupancy has to be issued within that 18 months. And if a certificate of occupancy is not issued within the 18 months, they come off and then they go back on once the certificate of occupancy and the deed restrictions are all recorded, et cetera. Then they're back on and they stay on the SHI. So between, so for the first two years of a project, once the decision is issued, they're constantly and, on and off. And uh, for, the, for the lifetime status of the SHI for the affordability, are we allowed to come up with greater than 30 years for affordability? Or is there a time frame that we, we have to adhere to? We do put the restrictions in perpetuity. And then we, the question is, is what is perpetuity? Is perpetuity 30 years according to the statute it is? Or according to our deed writer, it's in perpetuity. So we do the best we can in that. 
instance, and um, we have had some successes that others have interpreted as perpetuity. Mr. Newis. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Without getting into sp project specifics, that's not the purpose of this evening's meeting. Uh, the 40 B projects proposed in Lakeville, are they, are they friendly, 40 Bs? No. No. Not, not that I would say. Okay. I, I mean, they're, they're not lit. Okay. Yeah, they, nobody, yeah. Nobody's requested. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah they're not um, So I guess one of my other concerns, and just talking to some of the residents in, you know, areas, both areas of the potential 40 Bs, um, you know, some residents have said, well, you know, what happens if something happens to my well because of the construction? Or what happens if something happens to the septic? I mean, is that more of a condition or is that more of a, like, we put a mitigation clause in there? I mean, and what would you need to be able to say, oh, yeah, because of all this work here, you know, these folks in this corner, their wells collapsed or whatever, because we're getting kind of close to some of the folks. So the only way that we could put a condition on that is if the ZBA was waiving uh, local regulations, for example, um, you know, that um, construction, you know, within 25 feet of a, of a well, if they were going to waive that to allow construction within 15 feet of a well, we could then put a condition on that says that if there's anything wrong with, or the developer has to pay to have that well tested, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. But that, that rarely comes into play. Developers are very cognizant of wells yeah. and do keep, um, they do keep development away from wells, you know, right in accordance with the regulations. Okay. Yeah. On that same yeah. vein about flow, of water flow, mm -hmm. um, what would be the, the burden of proof to prove it was impactful for abutters for like well, that, availability of water. That um, so the um, stormwater um, stormwater is considered by the ZBA during the peer review. So all of these 40B developments do have to have adequate stormwater that ma maintains their own stormwater on their site. Um, it again is looked at during the Conservation Commission under the State Wetland Protection Act. They also look at stormwater. So really, if there, is a, if there is a water flow issue from the development to, a, to an abutter, it would be a private party issue. Um, and and we, don't, we don't really see those, honestly, because of the stormwater. When we have our, our projects are peer, peer reviewed by reputable engineers that work for the town, and that is almost, that, those are the comments I see the most are on stormwater. And you need to do this, you need to do this, things like that. Um, other reasons why stormwater would affect an abutting property is because the stormwater um, infrastructure is not being maintained. And that goes back to the developer and that also goes back to whether it's a condominium association or a homeowners association. So eventually there is somebody that we can look to to say you have to maintain it, you're not maintaining it, you know, you need to do something about that. So so that's awesome, but that wasn't the question I was asking. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, let's just go with it, it sounds great. Um, I was just asking about availability of potable water for uh, for people to drink out of their wells. So like if the water table. Like if the water table oh, okay. dips down. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, uh, it, was a, it was another yeah. question that was gonna come that, out, you um, answered it quicker. No, that would um, that would um, be most likely be also a private issue because that could happen no matter what was built. So we can't necessarily blame the developer because what if you have a well and four single family houses are developed, you know, right around you, the water could also drop. Um, also, we'd have to show they we'd have to show that somehow the water was dropping because of the yep. pumping somewhere else, not just because the, the groundwater levels are are dropping. It would be very hard, I think. Hmm. Anybody else? Um, no, I think other than that, my questions are like more specific. So, um, okay. So I guess in light of the conversation and um, regulations and process and timing that, um, 
when we do know that there's a project coming to town, it would be in our best interest to, you know, maybe establish a delegate and, you know, maybe communicate with the developer about impact to our community and, mm -hmm. okay. Correct. Okay. One final yes. question, if I may, forgot to ask earlier. Um, I've heard a lot of the benefits to the town if there was a lip in place. You, you briefly mentioned that they get access to resources from, uh, via HLC, but what are those resources and why are they beneficial to the so, um, I, they So I always consider a 40B, I consider the front end and the back end. The front end is up until the, up until the ZBA issues their decision. And then the back end, there, there's all kinds of technical requirements from the state, which are, for example, um, they have to have a lottery agent that has to monitor the affordable units and has to, um, they, the developer has to provide all the legal documents such as the deed riders and the um, you know, deed restrictions, things like that, the affordable housing restrictions. Mm -hmm. It's my understanding that um, with the LIP project, HLC will assist them in their, you know, in employing a mon or they'll be the monitoring agent. Okay. Um, they also assist them in their financial um, filings. So, um, you know, because they have to, they have to submit all their financials to HLC, and you know, rather than hiring a consultant, they can. I think they have an expedited path to do that. Things like that. Things that we, we as a town would never be um, involved in in any event. Okay. Um, I've asked the question numerous times. What exactly are the benefits? To, <laughs> and and I, I never really get a, a, a firm answer. Sure. Um, the other thing is that I don't, I don't know this for certain, but we have been. Um, I would say at, at this point probably 80% of the um, of the 40 B's that have come in in the past three months to our law firm have been lips so I think that um, I think developers are getting a better a better rate when a, le a better lending rate as a lip rather than a, a standard oh, we're at zero percent that's my 100% that's just speculation on <laughs> that my part sense. but we are seeing quite a few lips and was there a cutoff to when you're past the point of a lip being possible yes the lip has to be um, the application is signed by the developer by the, I mean, signed by the, by the select board and the developer. So it's submitted to the ZBA as a co, you would be a co-applicant. So right off the bat, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Critical timing piece. Mm -hmm. yep. So, all right. Okay. A D U. A -D -U. <laughs> so. <laughs> As you all know, on um, September 6th, the governor signed the Affordable Homes Act, and um, part of the Affordable Homes Act, Section 7, revises the definition of an ADU, and Section 8 um, requires that ADUs be allowed as of right in single-family um, districts um, within 180 days. So we have calculated the 180 days to be February 2nd of 2025, that's when this will go into effect, that ADUs will be allowed as of right in any single family zoning district. They do not, of course, do not define single family zoning districts. So we are, um, we are considering a single family zoning district, any zoning district that allows for single family, a single family use. Um, and so a, um, the definition of ADU changed very slightly um, it really is, it's either half of the size of the ADU would be half of the principal structure or 900 square feet, whichever is smaller. So if you have a 1400 square foot home, you can put in a 700 foot square foot ADU. If you have a 2000, or I'm not very good at math, but if you have a <laughs> 20,000, anyway, if you have over, <laughs> over 1800 square feet, you have 2,000 square feet, right. you can put in a 900. 900. Not a thousand. Not a thousand. Not a thousand. Not a thousand. <laughs> so, um, and the um, section eight requires that the town may not unreasonably regulate um, ADUs. It does specifically state that ADUs are still subject to Title V. Um, they would still be subject to wetland, the Wetland Protection Act, Wetland Protection Bylaws. It also says that they may be subject to site plan review if the town you know, would like to make that requirement part of it. Um, and that um, there's another hiccup in the legislation, which is that if a town wants to, if, a t if it, that the town has to allow for more than one ADU, but it's by special permit. But 
you can't allow for more than one special permit, more than one ADU as of right. It, it's, okay. it's very awkwardly written, and I don't think that they intended it that way. There's very few towns that would allow for, an, for more than one ADU right. as of right. right. Um, I do know that there are some Cape towns that do already, and they would have to revise their zoning. Um, and so the difficulty that we're finding is that um, the last sentence of section eight of this legislation states that um, EOHLC may, and it specifically says may, issue guidelines or promulgate rules and regulations to regulate ADUs. And so we don't know if EOHLC is going to do that. They're definitely not gonna promulgate regulations, but they might issue guidance. Um, and if we know anything from what the guidance that they issued with MBTA communities, you know, we, we I'll leave it at that. So, uh, yeah. yeah, I do, I have concerns. So um, the problem we have is timing. Because if you go to the fall, if you go to your fall town meeting to amend your zoning, most likely HLC will not have guidance by then. And then if you wait until your spring town meeting, you then you're after February second of 2025. So this has happened to cities and towns or municipalities. This has happened throughout the ages where the legislature legislators have a really great idea, but they don't think things through when it comes to a municipality. There's no town in Massachusetts that has their town meeting prior to February 2nd of 2025. So there's no way you could get ahead of this and also know what HLC is going to do. Um, so my recommendation um, to the planning board chair, my informal recommendation to the planning board chair was to maybe amend the zoning bylaw to incorporate the new definition of ADU possibly even incorporate it to say that, or amend it to say that any ADU is subject to site plan approval, and then, you know, just wait and see what happens, and then most likely they'd have, the planning board would have to go back to town meeting in the spring and amend it further. Makes sense. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So, um, yeah. there is a, um, uh, there is a, a webinar tomorrow um, that I'm, I'm speaking at, um, where we're discussing ADUs with um, over 600 planners have signed up for it. Um, and we do, HLC is um, making a statement in the beginning. I don't know what they're gonna say. I don't think they're gonna say that they know, they're gonna do regular or guidance and they know what it's gonna be. Um, the big question is what is reasonably regulating ADUs? So, you know, the things that we've kind of kicked around are that, um, for example, if you allow, say you have a principal structure and the setback is 20 feet on the side, allowing, you know, allowing an accessory building to have a setback of 10 feet would be, you know, half of that would be reasonable. Um, requiring that the height remain the same would be reasonable. I don't, I don't see any, I don't see any reason why an ADU has to be three or four stories above the ground. Um, lot coverage is most likely going to have to change. You know, if you have a lot coverage of say 15%, or even up to 25%, you might have to increase that to allow for ADUs, but you could fashion your, your zoning bylaw to allow for an increase in lot coverage only for ADUs. So then you're not stuck with this, you know, an, a lot coverage that allows for a lot more things. Um, every, every, you know, every zoning bylaw is going to have to be evaluated and, you know, and considered. You cannot, um, require that the uh, principal dwelling or the ADU be owner occupied, and you cannot require that, um, that the inhabitant of the, um, the resident of the ADU be family. So those, those, are, those are right in section eight of the, of the legislation. So who's hosting the webinar tomorrow? The American Planners Association, the APA. Will they be recording it? I don't know. I will find, I can find it. Can you put in a request that the select board in Lakeville would like it reported okay. so that we could get a copy of it? Um, that would be really yeah. good. Thank you. And it's, it's happening again in September. We're doing yeah. two. Okay. Because the, the first right. registration um, blew up because so many people tried yeah. to register. I just don't want to miss any so. conversation, you know. I think it's the 10th. I think it will be relevant. Yeah. September 10th, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So right in the, um, in the, the, the law, it says it, can't be um, an outside rental, doesn't it? Doesn't it? No. That? So it, that is that's an excellent point. Um, it it's very unclear. 
So it doesn't say detached or attached. It says that you have to be able to have an entry, either an outdoor entry or an, in, or an internal entry that meets all fire codes. So by having that outdoor entry, you can have it be detached. Um, and the question that I don't have an answer for is, can it be, can it be required to be attached? Um, and that's what we think HL, HLC is going to address, hopefully. From what I read in it, it was, um, it had to be 900 square feet or less, or half the size of the primary dwelling, and I don't remember if that required permission. But you could also convert um, garages, I think it was attics, and basements. one other thing. I mean so, so the ADU part of it is, it can either be attached or as a separate dwelling. Um, and that was the buy right that you couldn't infringe on, but you could, but it was still subject to local codes in terms mm -hmm. of renting an Airbnb yeah. and stuff. But it does say no short term rentals, so you can, you, you can, can prohibit it. short term rentals. You can, right. you can allow them to be short term yeah. rental if you want to, but you can prohibit So is that a bylaw we would have to put in place mm -hmm. on our own? Yep, and you could do that. Yep. And the other thing is that, um, it's my understanding that HLC is going to um, come up with some resources, and which would include, hope, hopefully, include a model bylaw um, that would have options okay. for short-term rental or not short-term rental. Okay. So to summar, oh, sorry, Brian. No, go ahead. So to summarize, so someone let's say has five acres of land, mm -hmm. right? No conservation on it, just five great acres of land, great soil, whatever. So they have their primary dwelling, and then by right, they can put one accessory dwelling. Mm -hmm. or, or they can at attach it to Or they can attach yep. Okay. Yep. But then if they wanted to do a second one, then they could go to the zoning board and ask for a special, special permit. Correct. Okay. Correct. Right. And, um, you know, the things that, that, you know, everyone needs to think about, because, you know, I don't want people <coughs> thinking that it's automatically they can put up, a sec they can put up an ADU. You have your Title V has to have so you're obvious you're without it you know automatically you're adding a bedroom yeah so if you have a four bedroom house and a four bedroom septic you have to add your septic has to be upgraded you have to because you're going to add a fifth bedroom yeah so um, you know it, there are yep. other regulations still do not to give anyone any ideas but wouldn't they just say that one of their bedrooms is an office. And so they could do that. They would have the board of health would require that any closet come out or right. any door mm -hmm. come yeah. off. Yeah. You have to physically change. Yeah. yeah. You have to yeah. physically change the interior of your yeah. house. Yeah. How that, that closet work? door. That's a tough one. Right. Yeah. You have to. No, like, it's well, actually. You have to take out the closet, or you have to take. You can keep the closet, but you have to take out the room door, the door to the room. Right. Um, on that subject, um, our. Yep. Representative from the um, Board of Health is here. Did you oh. want to come up and you had raised so your hand? I don't know talking, if you had a question regarding um, that particular topic. That, yeah. So just yeah. as we're as we're we're chit chatting here, I'm just trying to figure out where in town we're going to have to be able to give more resources to the Board of Health, the health agent, the building department, um, and one of the reasons <coughs> too is. There's not going to be the, the law, because I haven't read it from cover to cover. <laughs> um, there isn't a section in there for penalties for folks who have already done this, but now want to convert it and make their unit legal. Let's say they've already done that. So I can see us being, you know, at least in the early stages, a lot of work going on. And I just want to be able to be sure that we can provide you know, folks that whatever it is, like I said, for the health building, you know, with the resources. That would pretty, that would pretty much be it. Okay. All right. I think that we'll probably, um, I guess I envision there'll probably be a, a working group, um, you know, with the de delegate from the select board um, to sit in so that we can, you know, identify those, you yeah. know, those areas. I know you had something yeah. too, Brian. Um, um, the thing, I gotta go back and reread it, but my first reading of the, the new law seemed overly vague on if they're talking about, for the primary dwelling, livable space, mm -hmm. gross space, are gross. we including a basement that's not mm -hmm. finished? So it is, it's gross square footage. Yeah. So that changes dramatically the, 
the size that would be allowed for the ADU. And so then quickly says that's going to be 900, 900 square feet for But everybody. it's 900. Yeah, yeah if maximum it would be 900. Um, you bring up a good point because the first thing that I thought of was um, was my house, which I have a detached two car garage. So would that count as part of the principal? Would that mm. count in the square footage of the principal, principal house? Or? House, you know. So it is. It's so vague. And I mean, it um, sounds like I could stand up a five bay garage with a 900 square foot apartment above it and say, yeah, they get five parking spaces. Then... So that is the other thing is that, um, is that, Not the, that you need that the many town can only right. require right. one parking spot for the ADU. You cannot require more than one parking spot for the ADU. And if it's within a half a mile of a train station or bus station, ferry, you can only require, you, you, can, no, you don't have to, re you cannot require a parking spot. Wow. How would something like this work with detached dwellings that use compost systems for toilets instead of septic? So they would they would they have to comply with board of health. So whatever your board of health allows. So Hi, I board don't know of if health. you guys allow that. <laughs> I, don't board of health. <laughs> I don't think most towns don't allow that. Yeah, we don't allow that. Yeah. Did you have anything that you'd like to ask? Yes. Um, yes. The board of health part of it. So this is considered new construction if you're adding, um, even though it's by bright, it's considered new construction to add a bedroom. Because um, we give variances on most things that come in front of us before the health, because they don't meet Title V. They don't meet the setbacks, they don't meet nitrogen loading. Um, so under new construction, a lot of these wouldn't pass on the road. Right, they'd uh, have to upgrade their systems. But yeah. even then, we'd have to grant variances you, here. you don't have to grant a variance. That was the question. Yeah. If they don't meet new construction, per Title V, um, we're allowed to say. I mean, if they if their Title V system that's in the ground right now does not allow them to increase the bedroom count, I don't. They would be stuck. Yeah. And they would have to come up with a. They would have to come up with a compliance system that meets Title V, or gets variances. Yeah. And then um, in a lot of our town, because ponds, they have a zone A. Um, there's no increase in flow in zone A. We just don't allow, and that's through Title V. But, so that means all these properties that are in zone A, they're not gonna be allowed to have this by right. I'd have to look at Title V, but probably that would be the case. Yep, they would not be allowed to. Okay. If they do, it specifically states in Section 8 that they have to comply with 310 CMR 15, which is Title V. And then we do have our local regs um, that we've adopted. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of them that we said you have to have uh, meet nitrogen loading and be 30,000 square feet uh, minimum on some of them and 20,000 square feet of upland. Uh, but can they bypass our local well, regs? So that, it, that comes down to unreasonably regulating the ADU. So that would be questionable. And. Um, Maybe you'll be the test case. I don't know. <laughs> you know, they were put in long before yeah. this came out. No, I know. I know. Books. Some of these aren't new constructions either. Some of these apply to buildings that are essentially brought in and dropped on cinder blocks and then wired and piped. It's not always That's brand new from the bottom. That's still construction. Okay. Because you have a new you have a new dwelling. Like Nate would still go in and inspect that building. Mm. So it is, right. it's still construction. Okay. Yeah. Yes, Brian. This probably goes to the Board of Health. So we've talked about septic, but a lot of Lakeville's on private wells. Is there any, I'm not aware of any, but is there, is there a requirement on flow per number of bedrooms or anything like that? Would they have to potentially do a second well and meet all the setbacks for that or just tie into what they have? No, yeah. as far as the well, they would just tie into what they have. Okay. Um, but it's just the nitrogen loading. Um, you just need the square footage to mm -hmm. meet it. Okay. Um, which we do have a local right that makes you put a denitrification system in. Um, but if they could bypass that, like the 40 Bs bypass all these, they just don't even hear anything. Mm -hmm. so my question was is, is it going to be the same with this? If they're not going to, we, we can't enforce anything in here, we just have to approve it. No, you, the, the, the regulations require that this is a zoning regulation. So by zoning, these ADUs have to be allowed. They do have to comply with all other requirements. The question will become, are your Board of Health regula local regulations 
akin to unreasonably regulating ADUs. And that is a question that, if challenged, yeah. so I don't So stay know. tuned on, yeah. on all of that, so, too. So I, I guess that's one of my points in talking about support for, you know, mm -hmm. like the Board of Health or whatever. Um, so I guess it'll come down to um, what we want to do. Uh, because, all right, let me try to say this. So will they have to determine policy for the town on what they will and won't want to approve? So example, let me go back to my example, five acre piece of property, great piece of property, great drainage, blah, blah, blah. So um, they, someone wants to build one, you know, way far away from the original dwelling and they don't care. They're gonna put in a new septic, they're gonna put in a new, you know, um, a new well, they'll create a new well and everything. They don't have to, but they want to. So they just want to make it, you know. So then I guess it comes down to our Board of Health, whether and our regular laws and state regular laws on all this to determine how close they want to let these things go. So like, you know, or whether it's cost effective, I guess, I, that's so, where I'm concerned. What are, decisions may they potentially have to make for the actual town of Lakeville? They'll have to make variance decisions, which it sounds like they're used to doing. So yeah. they would take every application that comes before them on its merits individually and say, you know, they don't, they're not going to take an application and say, oh, we granted this for the guy down the street, so we're going to give it to you. They can't do that. They have to look at the actual plan. They take the property on its own. Every property is individual, and they decide if it's worthy of a variance or does it meet the criteria for a variance. And they would do the same thing with an ADU yeah. that came before them. I, my my suggestion would be that they follow their regulations yep. as they are right now. They have not been challenged. Yeah, and um, so also like the zoning board, so they can't just say we will only grant two dwellings on a property that has more than two acres. No, it has to be, you have to, you have to take each individual. application individually. Okay. All right. All right. Brian, uh, and then Bob. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, I mean, I know we're all kind of theorizing at this point, mm -hmm. but I feel like when it comes to like the nitrification stuff, that's not a bylaw that's in the town or regulation that's in the town for me to use. It would be the same thing if somebody exactly. came to the Board of Health mm -hmm. and said, I want to put three more bedrooms on yes. this lot, but you can't. Right. And so I would hope, yeah. you know, we all hope, right? But like right. The, the state would say, okay, that's a legitimate regulation. Mm -hmm. It doesn't only apply to ADUs. It's right. the same thing across the board, right. but wait and see. Yeah. Right. Mr. Jones? If someone has a um, current ADU, say it's 850 square feet, 875 square feet, whatever it may be, so they can go up to 900 feet, does it have to be the same level? No, there's nothing. I don't. I don't. So see it could anything. be for a second. Yeah. Whatever. I don't as long as it, it doesn't surpass the 900. Right. Okay. Correct. Mm -hmm. So I think what we'll do is um, we'll just keep this on the, mm -hmm. um, you know, keep it rolling, and mm -hmm. then um, as we get closer to, you know, because if this is coming from the uh, planning board for uh, Warren article, just to put that language in the definitions, mm -hmm. um, we'll just pay attention to February, and then we'll go from there. So. All right. Well, thank you very much. Oh, Brian, I was going to say, maybe else? this is a future meeting, but since Ms. Quessel's here, the, the part that already also worries me with this law is the part of the merger yes. part, because now we suddenly have potentially 1,850 square foot, three bedroom homes on 10,000 square foot lots, which is something we don't currently allow. We do. And 75, what is it? 75 feet of frontage. Mm -hmm. Is that half of what we require right now? So uh, uh, you require more than that, yeah. You there's require. a a lot of parcels out there that will suddenly now become buildable lots in areas that they weren't right now. So that doesn't fall under the merger doctrine? They're getting rid of it. They're getting rid of it just for those lots. Just for lots that are 10,000 square feet and 75 feet of frontage. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's the same as if you have the isolated lots or the separate lot protection, which is 50 square. 50 feet of frontage, 5,000 square feet, but they've never been owned in common ownership. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the same along those same lines, but here they could have been owned in common and they're still buildable. Good call out, I missed so, that. Yeah, it's so it's section 10 of the... Okay. Yes, John? So yeah, I have questions on that same one under our local bylaws. Now, we have adopted regulations through the Board of Health 
Um, I can read it. It says, no dwelling building or structure to be served by on-site source of potable water or individual subsurface sewage disposal system shall hereafter be erected, placed, or converted on any lot in any areas less than 30,000 square feet unless a variance has been re granted by the Board of Health. So you would have to grant a variance for all these properties? So we would have to grant mm -hmm. it. It sounds like it, yeah. Mm -hmm. it sounds like it, yeah. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. well, thank you for that. Um, mm -hmm. I just want to reach out to, you know, Derek and say, you know, I don't know if you're going to be impacted, how fast you're going to be impacted, how, you know, maybe it goes like this, and then <laughs> after people start getting answers to their questions, we find, uh, but, you know, keep a good line of communication because you know if your internal operations i mean i don't know if we can find money for a temp or something but if let's say we do get inundated this is kind of my concern you know i just want them to be sure they have the help that they need to i mean everyone here has got you know what acre and a half Mm -hmm. Not everyone, lots of folks, so I can see us being impacted, at least initially, with trying to get questions answered, so. I could, mm -hmm. I could probably say that your concerns are the same um, as with the rest of the board, too. Yeah, so, yep. yeah. And, and, and we, I guess yeah. that's a lesson for us, too. Whatever information we get, we should probably be putting it on our website. Maybe that'll, you know, alleviate. Yeah, the only um, thing that's going to slow these down are um, building costs. Yep. Or, if, have you heard anything from school districts? I mean, this immediately, we get all worked up when we hear there's going to be a 200 unit 40B. <laughs> now we have however many thousands of potential eligible parcels for another few bedrooms. Like, oh, for the merger? The, yeah. No, not even just that, just the ADUs. Well, the ADUs, it's, it's, it's unlikely that the ADUs will, have, will be, have a big impact on schools because of their size. Mm. So most ADUs that are 900 square feet will most likely be one bedrooms. That, that is the, that's what's anticipated with those. Um, obviously, tiny houses, you know, those are different, you know, where they make everything small, so the bedrooms would be smaller. But... Um, they, they, they're not anticipating that much of, a, of an impact. The 10,000, the merger provision with 10,000 know, 10, square foot lots, those have to have, those, those houses have to have three bedrooms, minimum of three bedrooms. And right. they're, while not in the leg legislation, the speculation is for, um, to allow for starter homes. So, you know, three bedroom, moderately sized three bedroom houses on small lots. Yeah. That would, I think, more impact um, schools and yeah, and I mean, to answer your question directly, I, no, I I highly doubt the legislators uh, reached out to school districts. I mean, it, again, it, it yeah. comes back to this vague like 900 square feet livable, gross. What is it? Because it's, it's gross. No, it's it's total. the 900 yeah. is gross or just yep. the primary? It's no, total. both. Both. In the definition, it's gross. Okay, yeah. so that's a little yeah. better. As we make these restrictions and guidelines, I just want to these uh, these accessory dwelling units are primarily. Um, lived in by elderly people, students, young people who can't afford their own homes. Mm -hmm. These aren't like, it's not like a nefarious thing that's going to overrun the town. It's primarily to help people. Yes. Um, so you'll send us that recording tomorrow, please. Hopefully, if, the, if it's recorded. <laughs> I'm not you. in charge of that. But I, I understand yeah. where you're coming from, but it is a little clearer than it's being made out to be. And these are generally designed to help people. It's not something that towns have been sunk by. It's 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 generally only been positive. Opposing view, if I may. That's okay. <laughs> the other option, which I've already heard many people saying, is great, I'm going to, I want to downsize, I can't afford to downsize. Yeah. I already live in a three or four bedroom home. I'm gonna build an ADU, I'm gonna move back there, and I'm gonna rent it to whomever. Correct. So if I live alone as an elderly person, I now rent my three or four bedroom home, what does that possibility turn into? Oh, right. No, you're absolutely right. That's, a family could move in. Right. That's exactly what I think is, mm -hmm. you know. Right. Um, and in so some cases, parents will move and let their kid with the cost of housing, you know, let exactly. their kids move in and, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So but is that, I mean, we invest a lot of money in our school systems and there is still opening for capacities. So at this point, I don't know, I just, I don't want to put too many restrictions on it without seeing how it goes in the natural ebb and flow first. We, the good news is, is you can't put restrictions. No, you can't no, put a lot of restrictions on it because the legislature clearly, you know, 
clearly states no unreasonable regulations. But Fantastic. they don't define unreasonable. So. All right, so All stay right. tuned. Okay. Mm. okay. Thank you. Derek, thanks Thank you. for coming. Oh, I have one other Oh, sure. Thing for you. Good luck, Derek. Sure. Um, <laughs> thanks, Derek. Yeah. I'd like to invite our um, planning board members up um, for agenda item number seven. Um, so the planning board had met um, last Thursday, well, they had meeting on Tuesday and then they had met Thursday, but they've identified that there would be a couple of representatives coming this evening to speak to number seven. Yes. yes. Before we move to this, uh, relative to my, my point that I brought up with you, would it most directly go to what was just discussed or what's about to be discussed? Um, I'd have to look at my message. <laughs> what was the message? I'm trying to just, just basically, um, that I, I'd like to see us. I, I think we're being, I'm going to use the word attacked. Probably not a good word, but that's, that's the way I see it. Uh, and I think we have been for a while. Um, the town has been for all of these developments. And for many of them, we just don't seem to have much in the way of control uh, mm -hmm. and I think we need more information we need to be educated and I I'm here to say I think we need to hire somebody to be a land okay yes consultant that's coming, okay. that's coming. <laughs> now you now it just all came back because I do know that I remember messaging you this weekend but okay. yes that is coming up in the next discussion Thank you much. absolutely thank you for recalling me um, members of our planning board welcome um, yes please yeah. uh, Dan Wilda member of the planning board and David Lodge yeah. so the planning board had um, well, there was a, a meeting regarding the, ex I guess, extending the Smart Growth Overlay District um, with the 43 Main Street parcel, which is known as the hospital property, um, because that overlay district is not over there now. And this, I guess we had a discussion, gosh, it was quite a few months where we had a, a collaboration where people came together and we talked about the option. Uh, this would be something that we would like to, to pursue. So I'm just giving some background here. So the, um, the planning board had met on Tuesday and they had um, voted to send a letter to the select board uh, requesting um, a special town meeting specifically for the purpose of discussing and expanding the existing 40R um, smart growth overlay district. Um, so where the select board had already scheduled a special town meeting for November 12th, um, this would have been what we, I guess, a special special town meeting. Um, but I believe you had a meeting on Thursday and there was discussion about this coming forward. So would you like to speak a little bit further to this? And I know Amy, you were at that meeting mm -hmm. too. So that's the request coming to the select board. Yeah, sure. So um, originally when we had met on Tuesday, our independent meeting, um, we had you know discussed this uh, special town meeting. And um, after our Thursday meeting um, with Attorney Kressel, thank you for your feedback. Uh, it was very timely. Um, the likelihood of us having to host the special town meeting is not going to be evident at this time. Okay. Um, and, you know, the reasonings behind that is Rhino um, at 43 Main Street has not currently filed a um, 40B permit at this point, um, unless... They did today. Oh, they did today. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Very timely again. <laughs> well, um, so, yeah, well, that kind of... <laughs> so it's, they're, um, so they're, they did file their comprehensive permit, okay. and it's supposed to be, um, John left, but I, I, it, it's scheduled to open. I was asked if I was available on the 19th of September, which means that if it does open on the 19th of September, the Zoning Board of Appeals has 180 days to close that okay. hearing. Okay. And so therefore, having a town meeting in November um, falls within the 180 days and you know um, 
you know, it, it's not free to hold a town meeting. It's, it's costly to hold a town meeting. So if you don't have to, um, you know, you probably shouldn't. And I, I'm not, I don't, I'm not sure you, you need to still. Okay. Um, we, we had some other developments too today with regard to the 40 R's that we're, we have to look into. We got um, some feedback from the state. So um, in, we need to look into that too um, about possibly expanding the 40 R to not just one parcel of the hospital, but m more than one parcel okay. of the hospital. So we, um, <laughs> we'll have to um, work on that. So November would give us a little bit more time oh, to, okay. to all right, and then prepare whatever warrant or um, map walk and lot. Yep, yep. My meets and bounds. Meets and bounds. Yep. That would be meets and bounds. I was trying to say. Yep. So this is bunk? So this is, yeah, we don't need to. Okay. So we can just, for the record, receive, we received the letter. Thank you. And thank you for, for being here. But don't go anywhere because we need you for the next discussion. Um, does anybody else have um, anything with regard to the 40? Yes, if I may, yes. please. Um, so <clears throat> with the 180 days, even going beyond the 180 days, my understanding, depending on the state, is that you know, should Rhino entertain the option, they could convert to 40R at any point while the 40B is 40, 40 or 43, we've got too many numbers here, 43 Main Street, 40B, um, is live. So they're not likely going to put a shovel on the ground for another couple of years from the looks of mm -hmm. things. So Correct. If, if they, a year in, they're finally like, mm -hmm. okay, you've passed the zoning, yep. we're willing to do this. It's not dead in the water yet. Not yet, except for the state <laughs> and, and the 40-hour approval. Right. But, um, right. but yes, no, Rhino could um, decide that um, they could get a 40B permit, they could get a comprehensive permit and not exercise it and then, you know, come back with, go to the planning board for a plan approval under 40-hour, even if they have a 40B permit. Is it a follow up to that? I mean, I, I feel any developer would say, oh, gee, you know, coming back and switching means more meetings, more starting from scratch. I mean, is it even feasible for planning board to have joint meetings with ZBA just to listen and ask questions? So, so they don't need to. The planning board actually brought that up okay. on Thursday night. And um, what happens with a 40R is that um, the 40R zoning will be. Um, it will be geared towards the, the project. And so, um, and, and it's really, it's a kind of an elevated site plan review. But what, what's gonna happen is if they go through, say they go through the whole 40B process, they're gonna have a peer review or the first thing the ZBA is gonna do is they're gonna send it out to peer review. So all of those issues are gonna be resolved at ZBA. So when they come to planning board, the planning board's gonna have the, the ability to review all the peer review reports, all of the you know, proposed mitigation, all of the proposed offers, you know, things like that. They're all gonna be before the planning board the very first night that it's before the planning board. So it has a parallel pathway. It, it really does, without, without being parallel, it is parallel. And um, you know, I, I, I seem to recall the last time that this was done with um, another, with the other 40R, I think it was only two meetings two before the planning board. <laughs> Oh, um, right. So, because everything was already done at the ZBA, all the peer review was looked at and fixed and plans were already adjusted. And, and given that they're looking at doing all rentals, the affordability percentage doesn't change whether it's 40B or 40R, correct? So they're, those 200 units, the same numbers are going to count because they're not for sale. Yeah, I'd have to look at the 40R, the way that, with that, the way that that's framed now in your, in your smart growth zoning right. right now, but yes, I think so. Right. Um, I think we would get we would get credit for all of the units if they're rental. All right. It, my reason for saying that, it's not like asking them to go 40R I would say, well, now it's 25% affordable, right? right? Where they would lose more money. Either. I'd have to check on that. I think actually it is. I think under 40B, they have to do 25, yeah. but I think under 40R, they only have to do 20. That's my understanding so, as well. So they it, would- It's a benefit it, to them, it's and that's why they them. go I think it depends it. if it's for sale versus rental though. I think that's a good point. I think, that's yeah. the point. Yeah. 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 I think for sales, 25, rentals, 20. And they're going to okay. do rental. So, yeah. yeah, so then they would be able to drop down their, their affordables okay. if they did a 40R. Okay. <laughs> we'll have to see. Yeah. <laughs> well, Amy, thank you very much for uh, no taking problem. the time to come out this evening. No um, I'm sure we'll see you yes. um, more frequently, you know, as legislation changes.
Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Okay. okay. So then what's still on the hot seat? So um, agenda item number eight. Um, yeah, sort of. Uh, the planning board had submitted a request um, to the select board. As we are aware, uh, we had in our budget, we had a planning position still earmarked for our FY25 budget. So that money is still there. How much is that? It was 80, 88. About 88. Yeah. 88, 88 yeah. So with benefits? So the, no, that does not include health insurance. So the planning board, um, I guess you had met to take a look at your needs and how you wanted to approach um, getting some immediate attention to um, the lack of a planner in the position. So um, a very nice um, proposal had come to the select board, so I appreciate that. Um, very, very well outlined. Agreed. So there's two parts here. One part, um, if I understand this correctly, would be um, a consultant piece of it, where you would utilize a, an external firm to come in and provide the support that you need through whether it be environmental, land use, um, maybe even um, legal opinions and support. And the other piece was um, a I think it was a support staff. So um, I'm going to turn the floor to you if you wouldn't mind just yeah, to. Sure. Um, so I can speak to a, a little bit about it. Um, so, yes, this would be a full time position with the consulting role on the side. Um, the board had met um, a few times on this, uh, primarily because there is a need from that department in terms of um, having that extra support. Uh, Kathy Murray, she's full time. She's been great um, for support staff for us. However, with the volume of projects that are coming into the town, primarily anything zoning related, planning board related, um, we're seeing that department and that volume get backlogged. And, you know, Kathy's doing everything she can at this point to kind of keep things moving. Um, so this additional position would allow for, um, primarily for our area to assist with the planning board efforts, but to also help us, you know, um, get things up on the website a little bit faster and more timely things as well. Um, and also it helps with vacations and so forth throughout the year as well to have um, somebody knowledgeable with um, what's going on with both worlds. So I know the audience has trouble. I don't know if you were here, but um, we need to project a little because our audio. Sorry, stinks. Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get all that, Bob? No, I didn't. <laughs> so, Madam Chair, this is for an additional position. Well, this is why you know I'm glad that they're here. But you know, based on what they had presented, you're you're now speaking that you need a full-time position and a consultant. Go ahead. Uh, no, uh, in, in effect, uh, we're take, taking that full-time position and, and dividing it up into what would be a, a, a part-time staff member and an outside consultant. Okay. Okay, so that's, I guess that was... Depending on funding. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Was that a part-time plus consultant or just a consultant acting as a part-time? Well, the consultant, we, we, we'd hire the consultant kind of on a, a as-needed basis, you know, for, for specific uh, uh, for specific issues, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to, you know, having somebody that were, uh, I mean, almost being on staff uh, part-time. So I, I, I guess now, and I wasn't here for the previous town planner, but I guess there were issues uh, where, where things weren't necessarily getting done uh, and uh, uh, so so there was a feeling that that having somebody part-time to do I don't, don't necessarily want to call it clerical work but uh, a, a kind of just above that mm -hmm. um, on a part-time basis and then the the, 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 the tougher stuff uh, we have a, an outside consultant 
that uh, has expertise kind of beyond, probably beyond what an individual that we would hire would have. Mr. News? Um, first, I, I checked in this uh, fiscal year 25 salary for the planner is $89,604. Um, I thought we've talked about a land coordinator slash conservation Sorry, person. Conservation, yes. Right. So we yep. have to be careful about clerical work because we do have a clerk doing planning board work. We've, we've relayed that to the planning board okay. on several occasions. Can't be a cler you can't, we can't be hiring a clerical person because no, there is a clerical would be, person. Would, I, I, yeah. You know, maybe uh, uh, an incorrect uh, uh, choice of words, but... Uh, so are we talking about a land coordinator slash conservation? Correct. Agent? Land use coordinator and yes, conservation that, agent? That is correct. That's what you are proposing. Right. So there's that portion of it, but there's also the conservation agent. So Bob had recently right. stepped down. So we need somebody... Um, with knowledge and expertise in that area to also fill in for that area as well. So this role would effectively assist with that. Has the Conservation Commission signed off on this? Have they, uh, do they support it? I don't know if it's been brought up to their uh, last meeting, but I'll have to find out. Well, I don't, you just don't want to put the select yeah. board no, in I, a tough yeah, position yeah, yeah. if the Conservation Commission doesn't right. support it. I think it. that there's, um, you know, any time that there's um, you know, a change, you know, in a staffing model, there's an opportunity um, to take a look at the infrastructure to see where the needs and better opportunity to try to align the resources. So I know that you have an immediate need right now for um, somebody to be able to come in and provide some guidance to the planning board with regards to land use and maybe some of the projects um, that we know are coming before you. So. Um, maybe the board will entertain the fact that, you know, maybe we can discuss, you know, the consultant because it looks like you do have a couple that, you know, you, you've already identified that you'd like to, to pursue. And then maybe um, we can take a second look at maybe the infrastructure and maybe put um, a delegate from the select board uh, to work with the interim town administrator and the departments affected to kind of look at that resource and infrastructure so that we, you know, um, can meet whatever needs are being identified and concerns. Mm -hmm. But I think that, you know, starting tonight, um, maybe, you know, discussing that um, outside consultant might be probably a really good step in the right direction. Madam Chair? Um, it wasn't clear and maybe I missed it. Um, is this a temporary solution? Is this like a bridge? Or is this the pathway that you guys think it was gonna be the most successful? for you moving forward? So I think, and, and Dave, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, definitely having the consultant role is definitely gonna help because they are going to be on top of what some of the rules and regulations are, state-based, as well as um, anything legal that might come up with a particular project. So, for example, you know, there might be something with stormwater or whatnot that we might want to bring up to them and saying, you know, this is a new, unique project where, you know, we're running up against this issue and we're working with um, peer reviewers on it as well. What would your um, additional feedback be if, if for example, um, there were differing opinions uh, on that angle? Um, and we've also found you know that the consultants are an outside party to the town so they you know work with other towns and whatnot which are um representative of you know they can cite examples for some of these unique cases with um the buildings and whatnot of what they did let's say in rockland or berkeley um they'll be able to provide some of that feedback um to our board and give their best recommendation Madam Chair? Yeah. So I guess my question is, if we have money in the budget to hire a planner, mm -hmm. why don't we just hire a planner? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, that was brought up as well. Um, you know, we had Mark here, I don't know how long, maybe a year or so. A couple of years a couple at least. A couple of years. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think the challenge with Mark was, um, you know, 
Got to be careful. Right. Yeah. Be careful. So, no, so no. What, yeah. what I'm saying, the, 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 the challenge with having a planner is that, you know, they are, um, you know, thoughtfully thinking about how certain plans should be done and whatnot and state regulations and whatnot. But what we're thinking of, you know, especially with this consultant role, is being on top of these areas as well and providing the feedback and guidance to the town in terms of what the best direction would be um, and to help the boards out with that. So, I, I mean, I, Madam Chair, through you, um, I, we, this was the first time we ever had a planner. Mm -hmm. And I think um, there was a lot of good work done. Um, I feel like I, I guess I just don't know why we wouldn't just hire another planner. I would even entertain changing the job description to work with the planning board to say, okay, so this is how maybe um, it wasn't set up properly because the planner, I believe, reported to the right. town administrator. So perhaps right. that's one change that we make that, because I do know in other communities, the planner reports directly to the planning board. So I guess I just don't see why we wouldn't try to work with what we already have. Mm -hmm. And my, one of the biggest reasons I say that is, is because um, we know we have a planner for all year for pretty much $90,000 a year, whereas I'm concerned that we would run out of money with the um, consultant. With the consultant. Mm -hmm. Plus, I don't know that the consultant would be able to give us um, supervision over that um, clerical, the, the um, administrative assistant position, because right now that's going back to the zoning enforcement and inspectional services. So that goes back to Nate Darling. So when we did have a planner, you know, that. Kathy worked in the, with the planner. They shared the office. That was where some of her supervision came from. Um, now, I mean, we don't really even have a room for a desk, you know, so um, I feel like I wouldn't want an outside. Um, well, I hear what you're saying, too. Um, but I know that they you have they have a need, so we need to be able to address this. They have an immediate this. need, is yeah. what I was going to say. Right. right, and that that's was the question: Is yeah. this a temporary, right. or is this a full right. time? Yeah, um, if, if if I could say one thing too, and you you kind of went right along what I what I'd say right along the edge of it, and and it was uh, something that I kind of learned, I don't say fifty years ago, uh, is is that towns like like they'll get taken advantage of by outside developers because they view us and and there's some some truth to it is that we're not well educated well uh versed in uh in, in the type of development that's being crammed down our throats now and uh an outside consultant that sees it in a lot of different locations can help us with those sorts of issues um, because they, they've seen it several times in several different sets of circumstances. Um, so that's, that's kind of why I think of a, an outside consultant. And maybe it is only a transition thing. Maybe uh, it is something that, that kind of gets us set up and gets us uh, into a regular into us into a spot where where we're we're back in control. Right. Well, yes. But she had first. Oh no, I was just going to say uh, my only concern with ha hiring a full time planner is to make sure, like we were touching on before, that if we were going to go down that road again, we really do a deep dive and analysis on what those departments right. need for structure in general, mm -hmm. and that goes along with the salary survey and everything that we, we're talking about in order to make sure that if we do hire for any roles like that, we've really put that thought and that, that you know, Agreed. that muscle into it to say, oh, well, where can we pick and choose and, and make sure we're getting the coverage for, um, as opposed to like just a very narrow scope um, 
but yeah, for the purposes of this, um, an immediate solution is, is necessary. Right. Brian. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I mean, I, I would, there's absolutely immediate needs right now. I mean, I am in support of figuring out something for planning to utilize a contractor for now while we start to figure out some of these other things that you've touched on. It's not a lot of money, and the proposal from the first company, Platinum something, um, depending on the project, that money's going to become really fast. Um, we have a existing relationship with the other um, firm in here. Their, their numbers, they give a broader range of prices for individual you know, needs, depending on what the project needs at that time. Mm -hmm. I mean, if they've, they've got the bandwidth, maybe we just keep going with that for now. And then, um, you know, maybe, and I don't want people to get shy based on what they perceive their experience with our first planner was, right? Just because maybe it didn't work out for a way that they feel um, wasn't the best for them. Like, let's not just write it off. Let's look at it again and see what works, what doesn't work. And it might be a combination of we bring somebody back and there's a, a line item for additional outside consulting fees so that, that planner can say, here's the needs of the town. I'm focusing 40 hours a week on town, town, town. And yes, we might reach out like we do to town council to say, it is, what do we do? Like, what are the, you know, the special projects that maybe they just don't have the cycles for? Um, you know, I do appreciate all the work that Kathy's doing right now. I know it's it's not easy. She got a lot of ask from a lot of people. Um, but yeah, we, we've got needs right now. I don't know how we can utilize any of that 89,000 in the next fiscal year or so. Um, so I have another eight. question to, to Mr. News, yes. actually. Um, how, if you have any experience of having two different legal in-house teams, mm -hmm. how does that work? Mm -hmm. Because there is a proposal to each of these partner proposals have mm. legal services wrapped in in part of what they were doing. If they're taking advantage of legal services, we already have a relationship right. with that could law. cause a problem. How could you know it, it, that could what cause difficulties? A problem. Yeah. It should be consistent. Yeah. So I'm just concerned about that. Yeah. But, the, you know. the rate was higher for the lawyer on than what we currently pay. Oh, much. Yeah, much. <laughs> yes. Like 50 bucks, mm. 75 bucks. But no, it, it's just a, yeah. a concern. Just it should be just for consulting services, engineering. Yeah, because it should not include legal. That could be a conflict within, yeah. you know, our own ranks yeah, a little sure, bit. Exactly. So, what do we have in our um, our select board line item? Because I believe we carry the consultant budget line. Not um, do we know what that is? Uh, and I'm only saying that now that um, because if we, you know, are going to, I'd like to see a delegate from, you know, the select board, you know, work with town administrator. Um, zoning enforcement officer, you know, because we had a planning department. Is the planning department mm -hmm. still in existence, but just, just a number, mm -hmm. you know, no support in there, um, and work and flush that piece out so that we have something that we can actually discuss and, you know, support um, that will work for everybody. So, um, but if we do have money in our consultant, line and i don't see why um you know if there's a need because you know town council it all goes through you know the select board's line item so um, for legal to, yeah and i guess so ultimately back to your point maureen we're looking at a part-time person using a consultant firm and hiring like a land yeah. yeah, land use person. And what as, I'm as part of that. What I'm thinking for for this particular vote is just the consultant. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And everything else comes and right. follows but after. Once we look at the whole conservation piece and whatever, I, I mean if we do the work that Madam Chair is saying we should be doing to figure out what the actual need is long term, not short term, but long term. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean we may say, well, if we increase if we have the money to increase the salary for a really good planner then we could get a really good planner that um so while in the same way i absolutely know that there's a need there but i really would like to move it know, forward move it yeah and and just like stick with trying to figure out what the need is for you know conservation agent a land use specialist i mean all these you know, and again, this was our first time at yeah. having a planner, yeah. you know. But um, you're good, 
not a vote. <laughs> You're getting a consultant in and, and separating that from the other pieces as right. long as we separate it into right. its own it has to be portion its own. so we can vote on it. Yep. Right. So, Madam Chair, yes. I'll get back to you th to the board tomorrow on the select board contracted services. I just okay. need to check a few things. Okay. All right. So would it be premature for us to um, grant approval to utilize the services of... Um, I mean, we have... It's August. If I may. You, you do have filing fees, right? Do you have a separate account for filing fees? I'm happy to check I can check on that, on that too. I'll check on that yeah. too. Thank you. I know, obviously, the conservation, they have wetland fees and they pay a lot of their consultants on it, but I'll check for, I'll get back to you on the planning board. So I don't know what the parameters would be for around this, if it's if to designate one or the other, because there might be areas of specialty mm -hmm. for each one. So um, I don't know what that motion would look like. But, All right. Do you have any specific projects for these consultants right now? So, as of right now, as a board, we haven't discussed anything. We're, we're actually thinking about future large projects that are coming here to the town. So, for example, 43 Main Street, um, Rocky Woods, and a few others that are coming up that are going to be large developments where we would need, you know, some expertise on that land use, that kind of thing. Um, where it would definitely be beneficial and beneficial for the town too, so that you know um, we would be able to have that extra third party, if you will, kind of giving us some insight and whatnot um, as to you know what direction we should be going. Um, again, it's challenging. I mean, not having you know the um, planning board director here, it's it's you know it's it's also challenging because of the volume of projects that are coming into town mm -hmm. more so than ever just in the past you know two years so we're trying to forward think this um and try to you know come up with some solutions that may work um to help us kind of get ahead of that curve um that's what we've been really trying to figure out um from there yes, so. i would recommend where they don't have any particular project right now that when you do mm -hmm. seek engineering services to come back to the board rather than the board just saying go ahead and you know because of the big the plan and position is vacant we have to be careful on how we're spending the money in case the board does decide to go forward with the planner yeah. um, so rather than just saying go ahead hire a consultant I think the board would want to my recommendation would be before the board takes a vote that you come back with a specific project mm -hmm. that you would like to have the engineer work on okay. consultant Works. Thank you. Um, Mr. Nunes, um, what about just general guidance on day-to-day -day projects right now? I feel that that is a is the need just it, it, in addition to the projects based on conversations I've had with various members, just that level of support, maybe not something that rises to the level of, you know, a, a, a significant involvement, but just a few hours a week. Um, I think I would be in favor of that, even without projects for guidance. But they are right now, they're, on those type of questions, yes, they have like legal counsel. So I haven't seen anything that's come across on specific projects that would require that. So I, was, I was watching the planning board meeting, yeah. one of those weeks that wasn't this week. Yeah. Um, and, um, and I saw that they were going through the process of creating new forms for the town. And, you know, there was a lot of discourse around that that wasn't super productive mm -hmm. um, and they were looking for guidance and looking for mm -hmm. things like that but that, that's just from my observations my conversations that I do think they need some help and some guidance at this time um, this might be a question for Mr. Nunes and the town accountant but agreed we have the money set aside for planners should we hire one we're already a couple of years into the fiscal year yeah. we likely won't have one for a few more months given the talk that's having i mean is if it was the appropriate thing to do what would the mechanism be to transfer any of this into a consulting line item should we say Tell keep me. in reserve the remainder of the fiscal year and maybe revisit well, it each quarter it. it could be transferred to town meeting okay and you know as long as you don't exceed the bottom line mm -hmm. you can make the adjustments either at the fall or spring town meeting. Okay, all right. 
appreciate that. So we would say that we would have X amount to cover us for this point, mm -hmm. not to exceed mm -hmm. that amount. Or if it's into, they may have changed a lot too. If it's into department, you may not have to go to town meeting. I will check on that. Okay. I'll entertain a question from the audience, Mr. Marshall. Yeah, uh, one of the things uh, that I haven't heard discussed relative to this whole issue yet is one of my goals is I would, as I understand how 40B works, and that's a real guess on my part. Uh, one of my goals is for us to get to what I think they call safe harbor ASAP. Because as I understand that, that allows the town to uh, require stronger mitigation and stronger control, which is something that I see uh, that we don't have now. So if we're talking about parameters of what this position should be, that's one of them that I would like to see this person work on. How do we get to, I, I had heard through the grapevine that there was a town nearby that had um, managed their land uh, wisely and were able to reach Safe Harbor and then were able to say there was a development that came along that didn't meet what they wanted. They were either able to say no or put significant mitigations on it and so forth. That's the type of control that I don't think we've had so far. And I'm not sure if I've expressed how 40B works. I don't know, even know if I'm right, but mm -hmm. no, that's, no, that's where I'm coming here. from. And I know that the planning board has mentioned that a few, the safe harbor um, threshold a few times, so. Right. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's in terms of neighboring towns, uh, uh, Easton did get to the point where the state turned down a 40B project uh, in Easton. The state turned it down. I'm shocked. Okay. Now, this was back in 2012. Right. But uh, one of the, and, and, and I don't think Easton had reached Safe Harbor yet, but they pointed out uh, a number of things that Easton had done uh, to that point that uh, the state was able to say, this isn't necessary. Um, and uh, it came close to saying, you know, what, what I've been saying uh, uh, often uh, was that the project they turned down, they said, is the wrong project for the wrong location. And, and that's kind of what I view Rocky Woods as being. Um, so, uh, uh, so, yeah. Great, thank you. Okay, so, uh, Brian. I was just going to say to um, the question, I mean, there's, there's two primary ways, and then there's probably others. One is, I forget the numbers, you gentlemen probably could spit it out, there's, there's how much buildable land is left in the town, and then the numbers based on how many affordable units you have to have. We're getting to a point where if the 43 Main Street had its permits issued tomorrow, we have hit our 10%. We'd be at, we, we would have hit our 10% and been we at zero. But here come all the caveats. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All the other 40B developers know that. So they went and start the process so that they are, we have to require them three years for that year? A, a long around. time. It, it allows them to stay in the pipeline so that if that one fell apart, they could still build anyways, right? Or if it, that one does build, they can still build anyways. Um, and then as Attorney Quessel said earlier, depending on the kind of unit, they fall off, they come on, they fall off, they come on. So the number's constantly moving and by the time that we hit it, It'll probably be time for the next census, and then the hamster wheel starts all over again. So and they'll then say our we have more people units now. fall off as well right. because they're mm -hmm. not in it's perpetuity. 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 It's, it's almost designed to never be able to hit. Yeah, it's not designed for rural communities. It's designed, yeah. you know, for communities yeah. with much more populous and yeah. much yeah. denser. Yeah. And I, if I'm not mistaken, I believe it's a two-year um, period moratorium. Yeah. yeah, it's only two years. So, not that it's only two years. But, well, but it's two years that we wouldn't necessarily somebody, have had. Yeah. Having somebody on board who's more experienced than I think we are, I think would be helpful. Mm -hmm. So, um, our, Mr. Nunes has um, provided a recommendation that um, as the, the planning board has a project that they would like to um, start 
digging into, um, you know, come back um, with the request from the, the board to engage the Utilize consultants. Services. Yeah. And in the meantime, um, is there somebody on the board that would be interested in working on um, the infrastructure with the planner and what that will look like and so that we have something concrete to actually say, hey, this is what worked, this is what didn't work, this is what we would like to see um, based on um, our needs and the best use of our resources. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, is there a, a vote to be had before the for the discussion? Are we going to vote on? If we can vote, we can vote on that. Um, you know, the recommendation. We can do that and have it on the record. I mean, I I can always do it. Plus, I have availability during the day, so I can meet with staff during the day. Um, you know, if we can wait until the end of September. I also could do it. Okay, well, let's just yeah, um, do the first motion um, yep. to um, empower the uh, planning board to identify an immediate project um, or projects that they would like to assign consultancy for support um, and come back to the select board for approval. Okay. So moved. Do I hear a second? Second. Okay, motion is second. Any discussion? Discussion. Um, I might be the outlier, but I, I do believe the board needs support now. And irrespective of projects, they should have some guidance and su some support just to get some of the routine tasks done and completed in a timely manner. Okay, well, what? That that being said. Excuse me. What if you scheduled three sessions with someone like this and you did a first one to spitball all your issues and your problems and what's going on and get some feedback and then a second one to follow up a few months later or a month later with all of your new questions and progress made and then a final one to kind of close all the projects out. And I don't, I'll be honest, I don't see a need for this. I like, I understand you need support, but I don't see a need for what's in this packet because what's in this packet is very expensive. For the whole um, thing. Is that what you mean? One the of whole? these, yeah, for just like one of these, this retainer basis for platinum, platinum partners is between two to five thousand dollars a month. So if you have a light month, we're still paying two to five thousand dollars for something that isn't being utilized. So it's good to have it there, but I don't think something that's like do you do you have that many projects that you need someone there every single day? I guess is the question. Like, is it something where you could lump all of your things together at a two-week meeting and at the end of the month consult? I mean, we would have to definitely evaluate that. I don't understand the scope of this, which is where these questions are coming from. Yeah, and, and my concern is they've been without a planner for a year mm -hmm. now. Yeah. Um, and things have backed up, and I think things could have some more oversight over them, and that's just my personal understanding of how the department works and where where it creates all these log jams for other departments. Um, and even if we said as a board, we voted 20 hours, you know, or something to be allocated or, or are, you know, up to a certain amount of hours or dollars, I think that would be beneficial. But. So what would your recommendation? We're waiting on a number though from Bob before we can right. do any of that. But it's not that we don't have money in that fund it's that we would have to reallocate at some point well the, the contracted services number we have to still get we don't know that number right now and then there's the planning position line understood but wouldn't the choice just be that we would my, vote my, it I have my concern it. is that they're going to use a lot of that money and then if the board decides to go with a planner or another position then they're doing that amount of money. Understood, and that's why it would be a dollar amount, and it yeah. would be set. And okay. you know, but we I would, think we would need to have to hear from the planning. Both right. They want that right. interim. What their uh, projects were, and roughly what the expense would be, you know, for those projects. Because if it was two thousand, or if it was five thousand, not to exceed. What is? Right. When is your next meeting? Uh, we have no, no. So what if we come back to the next select board meeting? We'd have the numbers that you need. 
the projects that you have and then we could make a more informed decision because Maureen is recommending you know more immediate support but some of us are hesitant about it then I think we could get that to assess it Kind of like we were doing with ARPA, you like a quarter number of some kind. Right, something. I, I just want to see, you know, them get the help they need. But okay. what, right back right. to Maureen's point again, what is the best plan for a long term? Right. I think that's the most important question. Right. So, um, so there is a motion and a second on the table, and we have discussion. So we can um, withdraw that motion. Um, table to next. Table meeting. to next meeting. Um, I'll withdraw my motion. Right. <laughs> motion has been withdrawn, Tracy. <coughs> and how about as far as Ms. Pellinger? Oh, I withdraw my second. Sorry. Thank you. Manager, as far as the position, the land coordinator. Yes, I want to get on that. Well, should there be a work group? Or? I think there needs to be a work group. Um, and I know Leah has offered herself, Maureen has offered herself. Um, and I think that this has been, I guess, confusing for a while now. Like, I'd really like to button this down because I know that there's, there was a, a reason why we brought a planner in in the first place. And I want to make sure that we are addressing the needs of this town. So, so we should be on the committee. Um, yeah, I, what do we? Well, first, planning board member. <laughs> Conservation Commissioner. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, Director of Inspection Services. Yep. Yep. Town Administrator. Yeah. Okay. HR. Would you HR. be just? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, not okay. as um. Yeah, because it could involve. Yeah, we're right. so we we'll job just, but just yeah. job description. Yeah. So HR Director. Yeah. Um. That should be fine. So who on the select board? I nominate Maureen Candy then. Do we need one? <laughs> we don't have to be on everything. We don't have to be on everything, but it's, you know, it's. All those folks are in the office all day. Mm -hmm. Plan around us. <laughs> but it doesn't have to be. It does, I mean, if, they, if the board wants to make a motion for it, if not, then there ha it was just a suggestion that there was a delegate from the, from the board. I don't. I mean, there's been other working groups that doesn't um, require a select so, board either. Uh, so. I mean, honestly, I can, um, I don't know. I was going to say I can go either way, but um, if it was, let's say, me, Brian, and Lorraine, we, and Maureen, too, we know what, why, how we got to that planner position. I, I think we would bring some of the historical knowledge, but you know what? Other folks that are sitting there have that, too. All right, so, so let's just get those get this going. Yeah, our planning board has a major concern. So, so no select board representative. No, just get it done. <laughs> Is there a time frame? So we can be planning board no. member, <laughs> yes. conservation commission member, the inspection services director, interim PA, and the HR director. Yeah. Come back to the select board. Yes. All right. With the recommendation, knowing yeah. with budget. Yeah. Do you want to get put a time window on that in a month or so, or? What is, what is what you, the what date now, the 26th? It's a time yeah, yeah, today's 26th. It's and next week. So our meeting is, uh, I think next so. Thursday, we have a planning board meeting. Okay. So we'll meet again a couple days after that. Second, yeah, the 27th. No, so uh, 20, 26th. Okay. Sorry. I think you have a very heavy hearing date that day too. Uh -huh. So if the next meeting you maybe put on your agenda what your immediate project needs are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and hours, then maybe hours, hours dollars, and possible concern. dollar allocation for that not to exceed. And then we can at least get you some support in the right direction. Okay. And that way, Bob, to your point, we're not overspending if we, right. if we fill the position quicker. Right. And then, um, what's we, the second meeting in September? What's the date? Yeah, on? what's it? The 9th and the 23rd. 23rd. Okay. All right. So okay, so by the 23rd. Meeting. Yeah. Okay. And then you have a meeting after that. Yes. Okay. So we'll need a delegate from the what's planning. The 23rd? The recommendation, the work group yep. recommendation. Yep. yep. So that would be a future agenda item. 923. Okay, is that good? 
Yes. Thank you, everybody. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. Thank you. Thanks right. for coming. Enjoy your evening. Yes. Yes. So are we? Are they coming back with their issues in two weeks, or are they waiting for the committee? No, they're going to come back at the next meeting. Okay. So they'll come back with a project or something that they need, but also that work group will come back with. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you very much, all of you. Thank 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 you. Okay. Twelve. Um, this is at the annual um, Lakeville Lions Fall Family Festival, which is scheduled for September 14th. I know I'm going to go back to it. Oh, okay. um, we're helping. We're helping. <laughs> uh, so they have asked for a one day beer and wine special license for the Lakeville Lions for September 14th. Um, the application is attached um, in your packet. This Lions um, event is one day from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. There are copies in here of the vendor liquor license, the insurance certificates, and the tip certification, which is required. Um, and all of that is attached to the application. Uh, so. I make a motion to approve the one day beer and wine special license for the Lakeville Lions Fam Fall Family Festival on September 14th. From 11 to 4. From 11 to 4. <laughs> second. <laughs> uh, All right. Discussion? Yes. Motion and a second discussion. I didn't notice. I might have missed it. Did they have a rain date of any kind? Because I was thinking that too. Because the, ninth, the 14th is a Saturday, and then our next meeting is the 9th. So we'd be you know, trying to play crystal ball with the weather on the 9th if they... Right. I th I didn't see anything about a rain date, so okay. um, would we like to vote them a rain date? No. <laughs> That's where you're going. <laughs> I'm not going to tell a lion what to do. They had a rain date specifically on the application this year. They did. They not. did not. There okay, will be so no it's rain. not raining that day. <laughs> right. So in my crystal ball, it says there's no rain on September 14th. Would you like me to reach out to them and ask them if they would like us to put a rain date on the agenda for the 9th? For amendment, it may be that they can't get their vendors in another day, so right. I'll, I'll be just okay. All right, approve so this now and then approve this now. And if they want to amend it, yep, okay. All right, so, um, any further discussion? Hearing none, roll please. Baby and I, Donahue, I, Carboni, I, and Dito, they I, excellent. Okay, um, in front of us, our HR director has um, a request to the board, um, acting as the Wage and Personnel Board, which we are in session, to approve sick leave donations for an employee. Um, so the purpose um, is the, according to the handbook, um, section 14.8.7 um, is a sick leave pool that's available. Um, with the approval of the Wage and Personnel Board, at any time, an employee can transfer up to five days of his or her sick days to another employee, not to exceed five days per year. Said transfer shall occur only after the receiving employee has exhausted all accrued vacation personal and sick leave of his or her own, and only after written request has been filed by the transferring employee. The transfer request shall be verified by the HR director and notation made in both employees' personnel files. Um, so this is under HIPAA, so um, we have to be, you know, very, so as of August 23rd, the employee's uh, leave balance has been exhausted and um, there is a total of 304 hours, which eludes to 38 days that have been donated by um, for the employee by other employees. Um, and the request is that the select board approve the sick leave pool for this employee. I make a motion to approve the sick leave donation pool. In the um, total of 304 hours. Oh, okay. In the total of 304 hours or 38 days, which have been donated in conjunction with FMLA. Okay. Motion. Do I hear a second? Second. If a motion and a second, is there discussion? Yes. The only thing I might ask is if we want to amend it to say just you know, to confirm that the number will not exceed the allowed FMLA limit. 
which I think is 12 weeks. So right. they have to exhaust their time. That starts the clock. I don't know how much time they've exhausted. Right. It, yeah, we don't. It, I think it, it won't says be, it won't be disclosed on right. the 23rd. So, yeah, they exhausted as the 23rd, so they'd be entering the unpaid portion of FMLA, which is where this would help out. I just don't know if that's 11 more weeks or three more weeks or what, so. Well, that we won't know. Well, I'm just saying that I would, then I would want the HR director to only pull in enough not to exceed. Not to exceed the, the time the limit that would be allowed limit. under right. FMLA. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Can we add that to the motion? Not to exceed the allowed um, FMLA. You could say up to 304 hours. Yeah. From... I don't understand. I need, can you explain it differently? So the uh, FMLA gives you a certain number of weeks in total. Some of that is paid based on our policy. They have to use up certain allocations of time. So that's like the paid portion. Yeah. Then however much that allocation of time they used up, then there's the unpaid portion. Okay. And that could be, I'm just going to use random numbers since it's an employee. So let's just say it was 10 weeks total. So maybe they used up three weeks of time of their own, and then there's seven weeks gap. Okay. So they can only use up to seven weeks of time. So you wouldn't want to transfer them 12 weeks of time, say, if they only had seven weeks left to fill in the gap. So we just don't want to give them more than they can use because FMLA only lets you do so much. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So not to exceed the FMLA, FMLA requirements yeah. or guidelines. Yeah. 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 My question is why wouldn't she include that in here if it applied? I mean, I'm she, sure she'll do it anyways. I'm just. But she, just so, for the record. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. We'll, we'll do that, I guess. And then if there's an issue, can she come back? Mm -hmm. Because we can I, ratify our vote. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. So what am I saying? In not to exceed the allotted FL, FMLA. Mm -hmm. Cap, yeah. Okay, cap. cap. Standard cap. Standard, Guidelines. yeah. <laughs> I know, I'm looking towards running through my brain, too. <laughs> this so, topic confuses all of us. To approve the donation of sick leave hours for a total of 304 hours, parentheses, 38 days, not to exceed FMLA guidelines. Fine. Works. Okay. Well, it's being used in conjunction with FMLA. Mm-hmm, yeah. Yep. Okay, very good. Okay, so Brian made that? No, oh, it was just discussion. Brenda made Brenda it. Brenda made it. Okay. So, so, yeah. Okay. All right. Hearing right. no further discussion, roll please. Uh, Fabian, okay, aye. Donahue, aye. Carboni, aye. Candido, aye. Day, aye. I don't think we need the money. Candido, aye. Thank you. <laughs> and it, is, it was not projecting. It's also awesome to see the employees do this every time they can. They really yeah. do. <coughs> Definitely pulls together. Great. Okay, um, this is one of our fun parts, um, looking at future meeting dates. Um, mm -hmm. So we are scheduled through September. So we have um, September, let me just pull this up. So I have it right in front of me. So September 9th and the 23rd, correct Tracy? Okay, on the 23rd. So the proposed um, dates for October would be the 7th and the 21st. And if it's the 7th, I would expect a, a birthday cake. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> that would be an action item. <laughs> there you go. Action. How, how many action candles item. do we need to bring uh, in? Yeah, we might have to get a permit. 40. <laughs> um, so this Columbus. would avoid Columbus Day. So that falls, I think if I recall, this is pretty much what we had done in the previous October too. So um, is everybody okay with the 7th and 21st? Yeah. All right, so let's do that. And then into November, we have listed here the 14th and the, the um, 18th, but we have November 12th, 12th as our, yeah. so I wanna make sure that based on what we have requirements to get us to special town meeting, Tracy, that these dates will also align with that. So once we approve these tonight, if you can just map it back really quick to make sure that we're 
in alignment with that. Yes. So we um, so we can meet on the 21st of October. Um, then we can meet on the 4th of November. And then we'll have the 12th. And then I don't know that we need to go to the 18th, but well, we could schedule it. And if we don't need it, Just pencil it we in can decide. Yeah. Okay. So let's schedule the 18th as well. And then December um, the 2nd and the 16th. I'm good with all of that. And then if we need to, um, if there's any last minute things um, that need to be addressed before the end of the, the calendar year, um, we could meet on December 30th, it's a Monday. So we can leave that one open just in case. Let's hope not. <laughs> I, I, I can aggressive. promise I will beat the bushes to get those licenses in, even if I have to personally go visit them <laughs> and hand deliver them back to the office. Because <laughs> um, there you go. I want you guys to have to work on the thirtieth. <laughs> okay, so we've got September 9th, the twenty third, October seventh, the twenty first, November fourth, the twelfth, and the eighteenth, and December second and the sixteenth. All good. Yep. Excellent. Okay, um, Madam Chair. Yes. Can we jump to new business? Because we have, I believe, someone in the audience. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, let's get there. So that would be. Okay. Um, new business. Yes. Is that okay? Yep. All right. Mr. Silver, um, join us. You can just state your name for us. And Wait till you get address. to the microphone. If you can have a seat, please. Yeah. We're speaking much louder because um, <laughs> we're projecting into our audience. But when you come closer to the microphone, it helps with okay, the very recording. Good. So my name is Rob Sylvia. I live at 15 Precinct Street. Um, my wife and I first lived in Lakeville in 1995 for a little less than 10 years. And uh, after about a 17-year hiatus, we have returned in 2020. And uh, we're ecstatic to be residents in this town. Um, since moving uh, to a new location um, in my employment, I find myself out of town quite frequently. And um, my last stint, I've been away for a little over a year off and on. And on returning, um, I've noticed there has been um, some uh, fairly aggressive encroachment issues that seem to be spilling over uh, into the residential properties from um, functions in the Ted Williams camp. And um, like I said, it, 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 not that I don't. I don't think that anybody's intentionally doing anything, but um, from when we first lived in this town to when we just moved back to now, it seems like there appears to be more and more functions spilling outside of the footprint of the camp itself. So in, instead of just a baseball game or a soccer game with people cheering and your normal traffic coming and out and voting day, now um, we have um, some form of uh, like motorcycle or car rallies and Sunday was a triathlon. And um, what's happening now is noise and encroachment on our private property. It just seems to be getting, um, I, and, and I don't think anybody intends to do anything. I mean, I am a car enthusiast. I ride a motorcycle. Um, I'm an avid outdoorsman, but um, like three weeks ago when we had um, some sort of poker run or something when everybody checks in, um, till 6.30 at night, we get to hear everybody's custom exhaust all day long. And um, I feel like an adjustment, a simple adjustment, like having someone exit and enter from Route 18 instead of in front of all the houses. Um, Sunday, um, we were awakened out of our sleep at 5 a.m. in the morning to people 
screaming at the top of their lungs. And it took us a little while to pinpoint the direction, but it was coming from the field of the camp. So maybe some type of setup or something, but at five in the morning, you're not mm. expecting that. Mm. When you hear yelling, you're thinking someone's in trouble. So immediately after the yelling, at six o'clock was followed up by a PA system giving announcements and instructions to runners and whatever else is happening. And then I thought it odd that there would be like almost a 100 car funeral procession coming down Precinct Street at six o'clock in the morning. But then we realized it was actually participants all filing into the park and there's a backup in front of our house. That could have easily been solved coming in and out from the Route 18 side. This is the commercial side of the park. But then as we're leaving um, for church, um, I have people sitting on my stone wall, walking in my mulch beds, eating breakfast <laughs> with coffee cups and wrappers all on my stone wall. It's just, it's gotten to the point now where it's just absolutely, it's almost like it's not being contained anymore. And I just think, I mean, I understand the enthusiasm of people wanting to do these things, but because they have permission to do something and because someone's given them the go ahead, I, I just don't think it's proper for them to think that they need to consume an entire neighborhood with their activity. I mean, even when we're trying to leave and it's not my call as far as safety, but Precinct Street was a nightmare for the beginning of that race. We had runners on both sides of the street, two and three wide, and there was still traffic coming two ways, trying to avoid each other and the runners. And um, a lot of the participants were very unwilling to move over single file. So, um, like I said, um, we are community people. We understand that Lakeville is a community. It's one of the things that we look forward to upon returning here. And we sow into the community. Um, so I would never want to um, disrupt something like that. But um, like I said, I just, it's getting to the point where it's starting to get a little bit out of control right now. And, um, we work hard to keep our properties up here. And I, don't, I really don't wanna to have to wonder who's in my front yard at any given point in the day. And um, especially on a Sunday morning at 5 a.m., I find that a little mm. disturbing. I mean, a, a, a simple courtesy by, by going and buying some walkie-talkies so they could communicate without screaming at each other from across the field would have been, you know, there's simple things that can be done so that everybody can still enjoy themselves. But we're actually consuming neighborhoods now with a facility that was meant to be self-contained for these type of activities. I mean, when we're sitting on our porch, I love to hear parents cheering at the soccer games and all the enthusiasm and the balls banging off the bats and everything. But, um, you know, when we start host hosting things like a polka run, and we have two, 250 cars and motorcycles coming in and out the residential side of the park. Um, you know, it may be good for them and they're enthusiastic. Like I said, I mean, I drive a motorcycle, but um, you know, after you've heard it for like the 125th time, <laughs> yeah, you're over it. Yeah. I mean, especially when it's running into six o'clock at night. It's Mr. Sylvia, right? Yeah. S I L V I A. Yeah, true Irishman. <laughs> I, I'm very thankful that you have um, come in front of this board um, okay. to voice your concerns. I know that this board takes um, it very seriously. Um, you know, our constituents, um, you know, our residents, that when there are activities in town that we have oversight over um, the vote, you know, to support the activity, we want to make sure that we are doing what we can to um, address some of those concerns. So um, yeah, we weren't even notified that this yeah. type of disruption was going to take our neighborhood over at nine yeah. o'clock in the morning. I mean, yeah, but these are the kind of things I think, especially with the races, um, you know, five o'clock's early. 
I don't even see if any. It's during well, I mean, the it week, was it's pitch early. black, and we hear people yeah. screaming. I mean, we realize that we still live on roads that are busy. I get it. I mean, we're 600 feet off the road. If I'm 600 feet off the road, and the camp is four or five football fields away from me, and I can still hear somebody enough to wake me up. I mean, it was a little nice out Saturday night, so we had the windows open. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, and we understand things happen on Route 18 once in a while. We hear the police reports we see what's going on so we're vigilant in our neighborhood and we we love this town and i mean i've watched it progress when we first moved here it was a year before the first train station opened um so we've wow. seen yeah. this town yeah. progress and now that there's another train station opening on the other side um i'm sure we're about to see a lot more and just the fact that you all are addressing the zoning concerns and everything, this will become an issue. Mm -hmm. The squeeze is on right now. I and um, in order to preserve our community, we do need to have some type of order, at least. Yeah, Madam um, Chair, could I? Sylvia, nice to meet you. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of where your property is and- it's The house with the white column. Okay. I'm almost right at the entrance. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Just look on Zillow. You Thank can pull you. Up. It's a clue if you need it. Thank you so much. Because I was thinking to myself, I'm like, does he have physical barriers to the noise? You know, are there visual barriers? Well, are there, is there anything? We're off the road. We have a stone wall. Um, we work really hard at even keeping that clean. I spend a lot of time with wood chips and mulch to make sure everything's presentable. And um, I found it a little disturbing Sunday that someone would just take it upon themselves to turn our front yard into a cafeteria. And before I yelled, there were quite a few coffee cups on the ground as well. Were all of those picked up after oh, the race? Oh, all but, but one. Not, we not, took care of it when we got back. I mean, besides the usual nip bottles for whoever comes yeah, by yeah. at a certain time every day. Mm -hmm. But that's expected. We live on our main road. I get it. Yeah. But for someone to encroach on your property like that and no one even takes the time to ask if it's okay mm -hmm. um no, I th so I, I think you bring up a fair point about mm -hmm. any of these races and anything mm -hmm. yeah that and we're I, doing um, anything that we permit through our well if it's an inconvenience <coughs> and we can help i mean fine but at least to us the courtesy of talking to us i mean mm -hmm. it takes me three or four weeks every spring to make sure that the wood chips are put in such a way so that nothing washes out in the street and we have to repack a stone wall and then for someone to just carelessly come and sit on everything and then as you're approaching them leaving your driveway they don't even give you the time of day and you know when you ask them to get off your wall and they kind of give you a, a condescending yeah. have a nice day so it's like, okay, well, I will have a nice day as soon as you're on the other side of the road now. <laughs> so, I, Had you yeah. already had the opportunity to speak to the Parks Commission? And is this... No. Okay. This just, I mean, this is, yesterday, yesterday was the last one. But even, like, well, the car rally has been two years in a row now. And I'm fine with it. I mean, but if you're going to have 200 cars coming in and out, then Route 18 is a better option. Um, and I, mean, I think, yeah, that's a good point so, to at least, you know, have yeah. the conversation with the Parks Commission because we're there, they're the entity that oversees uh -huh. the, um, the Loon Pond Lodge. Um, there is a um, management company that does run the events, but they can work with the Parks Commission um, to maybe address some of these concerns. But Yeah, but we do the, for yeah. the races. For the so, races, okay. for the races. Madam Chair, Madam Chair no, not only, I can just, okay, go ahead. sorry, um, so... Um, Rob reached out to me because he's a friend of a friend. So, um, and I said to him, I said, if you want to, you know, then come by tonight. And uh, I'm glad he did yeah. because he actually touched on a couple of things that we've all, you know, talked about over the years when we give these, this permit out for the road use, which is number one, we always require that they send, you know, notification to anyone. I know I got mine because I'm on the bike route. I know I did get mine, but it's a postcard you know, they, it's just a postcard. It can get lost in junk mail and everything else. So at, at a minimum, that's one thing we always say every year, you know. The other thing is, as long as this triathlon's been going on, I don't really remember vehicles being out. So I'm wondering what their capacity is, what their numbers are, how much, if they've grown their, you know, their participants or not. So I, you know, I'd really like to have us talk about it 
way before they would ever bring us the um, application. And I know two years ago it got a little mixed up between us and the Parks Department. So um, I just want us all to be able to sit down. And as we know, the Chief said six positions, detailed positions, mm -hmm. went unfilled. unfilled. Yeah. So I mean, has this grown to the point where we can't legitimately accommodate it anymore? And if that's the case, then maybe we can either work with them to downsize right. it or, you know, but something. Um, yeah. Something. Yeah. 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 Well, I, don't, I mean, we have a park so that we have a footprint to contain activities. And um, that seems to not be happening more frequently now. I think they're more popular. I don't think there's as many places right. to well, park. Well, this is a, I'm sure it's a great place to meet up. And it's also very cost mm. effective. But at the same time, um, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of residential properties on that particular section of precinct. I mean, we're dealing with the additional truck traffic just from the quarry. We're averaging 12 to 18 trucks an hour. So on an eight hour day, you do the math. And when Route 79 is technically the truck route and Lakeville's responsible for the maintenance on that road, that's our road, is it not? It's not a state road. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I mean, now we're dealing way. with well over a hundred additional trucks that are not technically local. And it's, I, I understand, I have a CDL license and I've worked in construction for almost 40 years in addition to being a pastor. And it's a good route for a truck because it's all flat mm -hmm. to get to 495. I mean, 79, you have your hills and then you have a light at the bottom of the hill. But um, it took us, uh, it w I actually made some complaints to the quarry because in the beginning, there was a lot of jake break activity. So that, we, I know that Jay breaks. Up. They've been better with that. Right. But even still, like when I'm doing my wall and getting everything ready for the spring, I have to wait and get up. You know, as they run in waves, they all come out of the quarry and cycle. So, but um, that's, that's a lot of traffic right. for overweight vehicles being added to a town road. Right. I wanted to just make sure that we kept it to um, while you're in front of us. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, well, I'm just, yeah. there's a lot of other outside be able to factors contributing. That's right. why I took the time. Brian, you had something you wanted yeah. to add. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a discussion that really we need to pivot to the parks and possibly also talk to DPW about what are mitigating things. So like when we have some of the festivals right down there, right. they cordon off some of the grounds mm -hmm. for so there's no parking and such. It sounds right. like these were spectators cheering people on for like the triathlon. Well, on our property. Right. But in addition to that, um, the route for the triathlon took a right and then a left at the uh, treatment plant. Okay. And then oh, somehow or another come out again and they were coming back. So we had yeah, runners going loop. out and runners coming back Which on both sides of the have, street. They usually have a route that they don't have people on both sides. Well, I noticed there was mountain dismount instructions here when I drove this evening. I don't know if the bike loop came back mm. or something. I don't know. Um, I mean, the, the other challenge too is like, well, there's more houses on that side on 18 is also residents over there too so like we swap one for the other with some of the things and also you know for better or worse for like the car rallies and motorcycle rallies we could say don't exit on the precinct street but if they're heading to 140 they're coming right back down precinct street anyways and it's a public way we can't control mm -hmm. the direction which you know unfortunately limits us but i think parks needs to get more involved maybe it's more about you know hey if you're going to put up speaker systems for instructions then you need to aim them towards the center of the park or whatever it might well, be. we have no, uh, a timeline for noise order. I mean, we're subject to a, a, t a noise ordinance. Right, mm -hmm. that's the board of health. I mean, we yeah, had a wedding health. in our property and I made sure every single guest was gone before 9.30. <laughs> I do that at every party. Yeah. Right, well, I, I was truly grateful, but I mean, I still, host. I mean, we, we try to be respectful of our neighbors. <laughs> so, I mean, five o'clock in the morning is a little early. Right to start that's, a function, yeah. I would think. That's, what, that's so typically I, when the triathlon is setting up. I've, yeah. I've seen them there. They have early starts for some of those waves. Yeah, I think we can we can make some improvements and have yeah. some conversations with the parks, but a lot of this is under the purview of the parks right. in general. Um, okay. I also, um, he brought up the point about the folks running in the 
and I've seen uh, like a few houses down from mine, they had the sign for the bikers that said, please stay single file, you may be fined, whatever. That's been a problem for oh, yeah. right along. Every yeah. time we we, right. we we all the races, we <laughs> say on the same. single file. Oh, yeah. Honestly, yeah. with the, I mean, we're talking hundreds of people. They'd have been better off just detouring traffic. It might have been a better option. Either that or blocking off one lane and forcing runners to deal with each other on mm -hmm. one side of the road. I mean, there was just as many out as there was returning. So I mean, it just. It was a domino effect. You yeah. should follow up with Chief Perkins because he usually gives us a report on were there issues, were there any problems. But if he was short six people, he's probably not yeah. at a great and level. Probably Maybe not, but he's still, probably here with a complaint right in. now. Yeah, he's probably yeah. 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 yeah, he's listening right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just yeah. want to make it clear I'm not disgruntled. <laughs> no, but this but is important that you the you know that you bring it to well, our attention. Well, it's consistently so. becoming more aggressive in the way it spills out from the footprint of the. Uh, the recreational facility itself. So it's no longer contained to a soccer game, a baseball game, a horseshoe tournament. Now we're, we're meeting up and we're using the park as a hub to go to and from. So that honestly is kind of like a whole nother function for that park. And I'm not so sure, I mean, was the park really intended to be used in that particular manner where hundreds of people would flow in and out of there um, on a rotation. I mean, I realize when we vote, the whole town goes there, but then the whole town leaves. And like, like I said, I mean, there was literally a 10 minute stream of cars coming by the house at 6.15 in the morning. I, it was, I almost thought it was like a funeral procession. And I'm like, well, who has a funeral at six o'clock in the morning? And then I realized it was everybody trying to get into the entrance of the park. Mm -hmm. So, and they were all coming off of Route 18. So why not just come in this way to begin with? This is the state highway. This is the more mm -hmm. commercial end of the entrance and exit um, to the facility. So, um, yeah, I would like to just see an adjustment made so that, okay. you know, we can enjoy our homes on the weekends. A lot of us are away. And when we come home, we look forward to be in enough properties. <laughs> Madam, Madam Chair, mm -hmm. can, uh, can we add that to uh, another discussion about policy for um, for the rides, for the forms? Policy. 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 Okay. You guys better, start, you better start meeting. you got a lot of I've got, I've got three of them just sitting on my desk at home. Right. Ready to get. Yeah. The Park Commission. Yeah. The Park Commission yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah. I think that they would need to hear it from you too. We'll, you know, we'll. F I'll speak with the, the chairman of the parks to see, um, you know, how they would want to, you know, engage the select board if needed, in helping to, you know, come up with some solutions. But would it be easier for him personally to reach out to me, or would it be better that I contact him? You well, I would think that the board. Would I can get yeah, your number. number. Yeah. Right. I don't mind. I'm just like if he's hearing it from four different places than four different places in the resident mm. might be one too many. It might be better for him to just hear mm. at his convenience, but that's fine. I'll, mm. I'll work with whatever would help. Okay. It would probably be better for you to reach out because really the only, the only feasible solution to this, because the only one that we have real control over is that they would alert you when an event is going on and you would put out signs that mm. says private property. Yeah. Because you there's get the Bob wire on. <laughs> something but there's there's really very little that can be done yeah. to, to in the immediate solution mm -hmm. so I think the private property signs would definitely help because if you line them up people aren't gonna kick them over to get to your wall I understand yeah. your frustration I, just don't want, I really don't want to have to get to that point mm -hmm. no I, I get I mean, that I have to keep a set of no trespassing signs in my garage every time well it wouldn't yeah. do any good anyhow because I don't know when the functions are coming at the moment right so, so <laughs> if you're in contact then they can tell you so I mean, like I said I want these people to enjoy their activities I mean everybody has a way that they like to blow off steam or a hobby or something that's fine but um, they're using a town facility and now all of a sudden that facility is morphing into another functional form and it's spilling outside the footprint now it's not like i said before not to be redundant but it's it's going outside of a soccer game or a tournament or, or something like that now you know we're becoming um some type of traveling hub 
or everybody just flowing through. So Leah, because Mr. Sylvia had reached out um, mm -hmm. through you, would you um, please check with the chair of the um, Parks yeah. Commission to see the best way um, yep. that uh, Mr. Sylvia could um, yep. connect we'll with do. them on that? That would yep. be really good. I'll make that. I'll reach out to okay. you tomorrow. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Thank very, you very, very much. Thank you. See if we can get you all home this time. Oh, our, our, oh no, yeah, that'll those, never happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lorraine's dead set against it. No. Yeah. No. I didn't get a birthday cake on my last birthday. <laughs> well, I didn't get so. either last year. <laughs> Thank Bye. you very much. All right. Thanks again. All right. Okay, so quick update on the um, building committees. Um, Senior Center Food Pantry, have we made any open, progress? It opened in September 19th. 19th? Yes. Excellent. Can't wait to hear that. Super. Fire Station Building Committee, we did have a meeting um, uh, two weeks ago uh, to kind of, you know, recap where we're looking to get to special town meeting, the pieces that need to come into place as far as um, design development. Uh, we did designate a process in which the design development can take place with um, the fire chief and those involved. So. Um, we're scheduled to have a meeting this Wednesday, but I don't know that um, we're actually going to, we might have to put it off another week because we're still collecting some information and it just, we wouldn't have it for Wednesday. Question, are you gonna have another open house yes. type of event yep. where you're gonna educate the public on every? Yes, we about? absolutely are. Um, that is part of the process um, that we had touched upon at the last meeting is putting together you know that type of time time frame and public outreach yep so the chief and his um, department are going to be um, you know working on some ideas for that so that is a very key um, piece of it so thank you for bringing that up thank you um, but um, just stay tuned we'll, you know, it's getting close to you know town meeting so old colony a uh, big update from last week's meeting. So the designers um, in the OPM had come back and I'll call it the big decision they needed the building committee to come up with that evening was, do we want to continue entertaining um, ideas that continue utilizing the well on site, a new well on site, or just go with, actually continue using the existing well, or I misspoke there a little bit, go with um, private water for through Middleborough on on the road or off the road through an easement because they essentially had to come up with 35 designs so far and some they said they didn't even show us that because of all the options because on uh, they are considering designs for 560 students 620 students 728 students 776 students and 810 students and there's all reasons for why those numbers are what they are so take all those numbers, then they had to say, okay, all those numbers, plan for with a well, also plan for water on street, or also plan for water through an easement. So the big question was, do you guys want to keep the well or not? And everybody was like, no. Um, keeping the well um, restricted where on the parcel you could put things, you know, because it's such a large well, it can only be within so many feet. Um, so it gave us a lot more options to consider by just getting rid of it. Uh, the, the return on investment, um, of trying to bring the well up to code was go in versus going with the private water through Middleborough. I don't remember the numbers exactly, but they're trying to build a 50 year plan and it was going to be something like 35 years out, I think is when there'd be a return on investment if you stuck with a well because of all the things that went with it. Um, because they would be responsible for all the things we talk about it with our wells, right? If, if there's any, all of a sudden a PFAS shows up or if any arsenic shows up or any of the other things they have to add in the future on top of just the consistent, constant monitoring, sending off samples and such. Right, right, right. Um, the rate that Middleborough is looking to charge is about one and a half times their normal residential rate. But even with that factored in, it's still, um, it would have taken a long time for a well to, to make sense. And between now and those 30 years where the wells ROI would have made sense, we kind of said, well, what also is gonna come that we don't know about that we'll suddenly have to start testing for or shows up and we have to start filtering for. So the entire room was pretty unanimous of like, let's not even entertain the well option. So that cut, like, I think they said like two thirds of the options out that they don't have to consider. So they can go back now and start kind of honing in on, okay, what does it look like to 
staff. They have to submit bringing up the existing building to code and not doing anything, um, doing an addition or renovation for those student numbers I mentioned, like they'll come up with options for all of them, as well as a, a new entire build. Um, the numbers are still very wishy-washy right now, but just to bring the building up to code was like as much money as doing a, mm -hmm. a big renovation mm -hmm. on it. And that was even more in some cases of a full new build. The building today is, I might get this slightly wrong, 104,000 square feet. And if they don't change the number of students, if they don't change any of their programming or anything, the state is telling them that they should be closer to like 224,000 square feet. So they're already less than half the size the state says they should be. I'll just interrupt you because I, I don't know. Sorry. Are they proposing two levels on where they're going now or are they going to have a spread out campus? Um, that is yet to be seen, but they have said that two stories makes things easier because there is less foundation yeah. they don't have to put in elevators i'm going to hold off on that statement i don't know about ada but yeah. um, when they get the three stories it changes a little bit because then there's more structural components uh, but going with two stories that lets them put it in a lot more places on the parcel and it makes it a lot easier to not disturb again this is only for the full build option it, they won't disturb the athletic fields mm -hmm. um, as easily or the children learning in the new the new um, in the existing building because some of the things that they're trying to factor in is like well well for all these options what is the timeline to get it done and how much is it going to impact the existing learning that's going on um, so they're still trying to work that through renovations are actually like years longer um, because they can only do it certain times of the year they have to work around all the children um, so they were kind of just giving us ballpark figures and they were saying like look a renovation is probably four to five years they said if, you, if it comes down to a full build, you're probably looking at like two to three because you're not working around as many restrictions. Uh, so that was the big thing. Um, the 560 students is if they don't really change anything. Um, once they get up to 728 students, that's when they can start to consider adding things like uh, HVAC or plumbing. Um, 620 students, they would have, I believe, the same programming but be considered right size by the state. Um, so then they would have enough students in all the classrooms, the classrooms would be big enough, and um, go from there. So more to be seen, they expect to have the preliminary design presentation, PDP I think it is, done late September. So that'll be the, the next big update. Wow. So, Excellent. Lots, lots to go. The numbers are staggering. Like the the amount of square feet we don't have compared to what the state says we should have. Some of the some of the classrooms they have today are not even the square footage as what the state considers like a small learning room today, mm -hmm. like a little study room. So it's, uh, it's an interesting project, to say the least. They're still on schedule for fall 2025 for potential funding requests, whatever it ends up being. So just keep that in mind. And the school department, the school committee We'll have to decide if it's one vote in all the towns the same hours or if it's individual votes town by town. I don't gotcha. know when they'll do that. Crystal Plymouth did the one day vote, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Town Administrator Search Committee. Um, so we have a meeting Thursday to uh, discuss a couple of things, including um, just have Lacey update the actual committee on uh, the conversation that she and Brian had with council, because a few folks, and I made the offer to them, and they said, no, we'll, um, we'll let Lacey explain it to us. Um, so, um, but they all are interested in what you know council had to say and you know as the way questions were asked and everything so we'll do that and then we do we received today a couple more of the essays but um the interviews will be held on september 5th one day for how many yep um not exactly sure but uh, four, possibly five. Um, and then um, we'll do the um, the interviews on one day. In this room, curtains drawn to allow as much, you know, 
confidentiality for folks. <coughs> okay. Yep. It, thinking back to the last time we did this, I don't think we thought of it then, but we, if we have more than one person for the finalists, we probably don't want to be streaming them. <laughs> so, no, so I think like, the last no. time we had to, because we were it's still- COVID. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. We had talked about that in one of our meetings that we would have them uh, record it, but not show it until yeah. after everyone was done. Perfect. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think we were saying that we could do it right at the beginning um, of the meeting or something, or do a special part or whatever for the interviews if we don't want to combine it with a business meeting, but we'll have to address that with the chair and the town administrator when we get to that point. Okay, excellent. Okay. And I mean, we can be talking about that now, you know, after, because we know that date, that date is set um, for the interview, so. Okay, and when does the select board meet after that? We have to pick our date, so we're in the 9th? The 9th and the 23rd. Yeah. Okay, so hopefully we'll have, we'll have to have schedule a special um, evening for those interviews. I know we went to new business. Anybody else have any new business? Okay, old business. A uh, quick update on the ARPA. Um, As I mentioned earlier, the COA edition bids open September 19th. The Clay Pond Park water project bids are open September 16th. Uh, and we're in the process of scheduling the bid open for the old town hall restroom project. Would you be able to send the board another, you know, just an update of the, the chart that you had done for, yeah. um, for that? Uh, quick question, if I may, Madam Chair. Yes. Where do we stand, sir, on the um, the provisional projects we had voted in case of others falling through? Um, we have the, the lights and that's some other stuff. Yeah, I'm just kind of waiting okay. to see if there's to make a decision. Did you vote? I don't know. I haven't seen anything, estimates or anything. We had voted through 130. If something, I don't remember the actual motion. I have to go back and look at it because it was that. It was the and snack then I had shack. that extra one that, that no one um, seems very keen on. <laughs> and I'll have to go back and look at the wording. Has the Clear Pond engineering progressed at all? That's what we were just talking uh, about. No, that's the federal project. I believe. Yeah, that's on the federal side. We haven't done anything on that. There's no really time frame on that. I'm waiting for the uh, uh, cost for the, the bid for the engineering, uh, the, clay, the water project. Uh, and we're running tight on the balance for the direct funding, which is the engineering for Clear Pond. So once we know the cost of the projects ongoing, then I think it would be time for the engineering for Clear Pond. Okay. So it's more of a way to see how much money we have remaining. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Um, I'm just going to touch upon this because I'm going to add this again to the next meeting. But um, this the select board had already ventured into um, se setting up subcommittees. Um, we have a policy subcommittee an informational technology subcommittee, communication and community outreach subcommittee, and Lakeville Citizens Academy subcommittee. And these are proposed. These have not been voted. Um, so there was some homework that was being done uh, because one, we needed a charge. And we needed committee makeup. And I believe we received a uh, draft for the information technology subcommittee um, for your review. And we also received one for the Communication and Community Outreach Subcommittee. Uh, Brenna, A plus. I think they all should look like this, but um, yeah. Sorry, Brian, yours is good too. No. <laughs> Content wise, it's all good. Uh, so I guess how I would like to be able to approach this is that we would need a vote from this, um, from this board to designate these subcommittees. But in order to do we do that before or do we do it wait until we actually have the charge and the makeup is my question uh, to you. I assumed charge and makeup. Yeah. Charge and makeup and then yep. 
So did everybody have a chance to take a look at the Technology Advisory um, Committee? The only thing I didn't see in here, Brian, um, so you have a select board um, member, um, and it, oh, and a delegate. That's good. Uh, On the or, or a one. delegate if there was no select board member, yeah. Okay. Um, the IT director, um, if one didn't exist, obviously a select board um, delegate. A member delegated by the Lakeville um, Chief of Police, and two at-large members from the public um, with qualifying industry experience. So I think that's pretty, um, that's how many, is that five? I think it's five. I'm having trouble counting this lead. That's okay. One, two, three, four, five, yep. Because um, I think at the last meeting there was a policy that we want to delegate down to the subcommittee, so. <laughs> um, that was emails, wasn't it? Wasn't yeah, that it was, the, the one? It was the emails for all the committee members. It's an action item. Yeah. It was an action item, yeah. That's true. So, um, anybody have any questions about this? Because I, I believe... Um, no, I think this is simple and to the point and yeah. well executed. So, so I'll How can they make modifications if, if um, necessary? The, where it's a, the purposes of defining technology where it talks about um, what it's limited to. Mm -hmm talks about hardware purchases or leases. Mm -hmm. Does this mean the committee would be purchasing things? Or would no, they be recommending? No, no, no. Um, so that, that list was intended just to kind of say, um, when we were talking, when we use the word technology, here are the things that we're saying are within that definition. Um, this group would have no purchasing authority or whatnot. They would just be able to look at software that's being purchased uh, either perpetual license or through subscription and kind of say like, yeah, that makes sense. No, that doesn't make sense. Or here's another way to acquire that same thing, maybe for a better discount or ways to bundle things. Okay. Um, but yeah, no, nobody's going to pull out a checkbook in this group. Yeah, it does have the term advisory. So whenever you see that anywhere in there, that lets you know that you you have the power to say what you think, but not, but not right. <laughs> recommendations come to the main body. And also the for, opportunity for to get told no. Yes. <laughs> um, so uh, one of I guess we have a format I think that we have, we've been using for subcommittees. Just if we can just I like the draft, but I'd like to approve it into. Yeah, I know. Maureen's like, can we move to this, please? Um, I'm going to need a consultant to redo this in that form. But we'll get there. Template, please. Yes. <laughs> Template. I didn't even have to ask her to do that. I, I she <laughs> just, yeah. Yeah. When I, yeah, when I looked at it, I was like, <laughs> yeah. oh, I know who's this oh, yeah. committee is. <laughs> so I'd like to have a, you know, when the policy subcommittee um, actually forms, I'd like to have a policy on a standardization of um, the policy policy on the policies. policies. <laughs> Um, all right, so I'll entertain a motion. Um, are we going to call it the Technology Advisory Committee? You like that? I like TAC better than ITS. Okay, <laughs> I like TAC. It's a TAC. It's very tactful. Tactical. Um, okay. So I'll entertain Tacky. a motion to so moved. designate a Technology Advisory Committee, also known as TAC, T A C. Um, with the charge and the overview presented and the proposed composition. So moved. Second. Motion and second discussion. My discussion is um, that this would fall in line with um, the regular appointed um, subcommittees from the main body, which is the select board. Um, so this would be into term. So however we you know get this advertised um, and look for interest, mm -hmm. we'll, I'll work with um, the town administration office to get them on the future agendas for approval. Um, so I'll just say it one more time. Select board member, um, the IT director, a member delegated by the Lakeville uh, Chief of Police, and two at-large members from the public with qualifying industry experience. And if it's helpful, the reason I put a delegate from chief of police because they one of our largest technology mm -hmm. using right. departments. Madam Chair, do you want the at large members advertised? Yes. Okay. okay. Any further discussion? Just one. Um, do you have anything deeper on qualifying experience? That you, you get to make that up you when you decide on them. <laughs> 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 
I don't want to be too detailed because then people feel yeah. nervous to even say I'm interested. Okay. Okay. All right. I'd like roll call vote, please. Baby and I. Tony, you aye. Carboni, aye. Candido, aye. Stay aye. We have our first new subcommittee. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Um, in front of us is the Communication and Community Outreach Subcommittee um, proposal. Um, Brenda worked on this one. Um, <coughs> so it has the intention to charge the mission statement. Um, and Brenda and I did speak briefly about the composition. So we did, um, Brenda did include roles um, that the committee would, I guess, um, assume, assume um, for their directive and outcome. But we need an actual makeup of the committee. Sure. Um, so I spoke with Principal Dessert on Friday, and I had asked if any, she thought any students would be open to doing something like this, because where one of the roles is marketing and communication, and something like this committee would really rely on social media and, and spreading awareness. I thought having um, you know, someone from the school or someone who is younger and interested in something like this running the social media would get more um, attention to it. I didn't really consider the specifics of who the composition would be, so I apologize. Um, I think the chair would be a select board member. And then, depending on how everybody else felt, if we wanted, if they could, um, if a student could hold one of the roles themselves, then that could be a single, a single chair. Otherwise, you could have um, someone who's either appointed, or Lorraine had mentioned a member of staff who they could maybe work with or alongside. So have someone um, employed by the town who would run the social media so that you know the student couldn't post anything you know, inappropriate, but also let them kind of have the reins. Um, volunteer and outreach coordinator or an event coordinator. They would be working closely together, so I thought maybe a member of the Arts and Music Festival would want uh, a representative on there. So the breakdown would be a select board member, three staff, one student, and a community member at large. But this isn't hard and fast, I don't. So we have select board member, three staff, one student. Well, what do you mean? We only have one. No. We, have colony. Whole colony. we have a Ponica oh, okay. and we have Bristol Aggie. Yeah, that's fair. I'm going to ask a question because I just don't know. Do they have to be 18? Do they have to be voting? How does this work? No, I had, um, we had Kyle, uh, I can't remember Kyle's last name anymore, but he was on like the, uh, the superintendent search committee and he was a student uh, and I think he was about 15, 16 at the time. Um, and we had other students on there for an advisory committee okay. for a superintendent, so there's precedent. Um, Can you look into that, Mr. Newman? What, to be on a subcommittee? Yeah, if, there, if there's a... You don't, you don't, there's no age. There's no age? Okay. Yeah. All right. Madam Teach. Chair. But we do have a bylaw that says they have to be a registered voter of Lake Bell. Okay. So, so they would so have, have to be 18 okay. and a registered okay. voter. Okay. Yes. And they'd have to be a Lake Bell resident. That is actually a select board policy. Okay. I Which it. I don't know. I found it. Leah? <laughs> <Excellent. laughs> so that almost would turn into like a senior project, depending on where their birthday falls. You know, they, you could also point. have, um, I know with the, the school committee, they have um, the student attend. Uh, Camille, the, the student body president, she's right. the one that did So they, you know, you could always invite a student just for um, maybe input. To, as to some of the areas where they feel um, maybe with the kids. Yeah. Student yeah. liaison. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I like that. Not a, not a voting member, but it, somebody that would be able to provide some insight. So you had select board member, um, three staff, which would you know just ask for volunteers. You know, and they would participate. Um, student liaison. Um, and who else did you say? I had one community member at large, but if there's only going to be one, um, if there will only be one student I involved, two. I would do two community members at large. So select board, two staff, 
two community at large and one student. When, when we say staff though, this is in their own personal time? What I mean, this isn't a new right. job description line, is it? No. No. Volunteer. Just be cautious Volunteer. with that. Volunteer. Um, I mean, maybe that becomes maybe one staff, two staff, uh, and then maybe it gets to city. I just, I think. We can hammer it out and figure out. And well, if we're voting it, and it's gonna go out, so. Oh, okay. Because um, it's important that we I love the. To I be, what do you think, Mr. If I may, to be honest with you, I don't see anybody volunteering. Okay. To be honest with you, I, mean, yeah, I just fine. don't want to. All right. So maybe it's maybe it's a an opportunity for this committee once designated um, to maybe meet with department heads to find out what areas um, you know their staff might feel yeah, that right information could be improved. Yeah, sure. So, so Brenna, would that be a member of the select board, a member of the high school, and three at-large members then, if you we were getting rid of staff or not? So four month, four voting members though. Um, if the student yeah. is a. Oh, <coughs> the student would be a voting member, wouldn't they? Or would they just be a liaison? We, I thought I heard liaison. liaison. Oh, okay. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So we have one select board member, we have a, a student liaison. Um, Madam Chair, yes. how about someone from Lake Camp? Mm -hmm. That's a great idea. I don't think so. No, I think that's an excellent idea. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know why we didn't even think of that. <laughs> that's great. We're okay. talking about you, Lake Camp. <laughs> We're up for it. We can ask. We can ask. All right, so I'm still only at four. Do we want to do three community members? Yeah, we can do that. Well, let's see, what else we got for boards and whatnot? Did somebody already say historical or, or no, arts? You said like you oh, said arts, arts, but. We could do parks, would parks want to participate? But I think that this might be, well. If we leave it open, anyone could participate. Right. Okay, so we'll leave it open. We'll do a select board, one staff, and three members at large. And then because the student liaison can't vote or any of that, that'll just leave that open to whomever wants to. I think we're taking staff off completely. Okay, okay. then that would be four members at large? Or, is, or are we sticking to a, an 18 year old student from Lakeville who can vote? That would be community at large. Well, now I'm confused. <laughs> uh, Madam Chair, I have one select board member, a student liaison, a member possibly of Lake Cam, yep. and three at large members. Right, that would be. Okay. So that would be one, two, that would be five voting members and the student liaison. Right. Okay. If we get the president of Lake Cam. Right. So we We're might have to revisit this library. if, you know. Oh. Library. library. Yeah. It just having a thought over here, I don't know how to articulate it well, but the the library has a huge connection to the, um, the community. I don't know if the director would be a good person to approach for nominating somebody. That's a good or, idea. So why don't we do like Kim or library? And then that way, if one can't do it, the other might be able to. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Why don't we do like Kim or library? So we have more oh. than just a, a position. Because I feel like if we vote in a specific position for Lake Cam, it has to go to Lake Cam, correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. So why don't we yep. include the library as part of that search? I think I'd like to see a library full time <coughs> as like a spot of its own. Yeah. yeah. And okay. we could do Lake Cam slash community member if someone from Lake Cam doesn't want it then okay. we could do a community member, but I think library should be represented. Okay. Yep. Select board one, library one. Um, the liaison, but that's not a voting member. Three community members at large, and then a member from Lake Cam. And if they can't make it, then it would be four community members at large. Is that good? So that's a that's a, a delegate appointed by library. 
not, not library specifically, because then we're back to staff. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It works. So could it be a friend of the library? Could be. Yeah. So about, yeah. about mm -hmm. um, someone associated with the library? Well, you just have the director make a recommendation. And yeah. it could be a friend, could be somebody in the trustees, it could be themselves. Library delegate. Yep. They're out there. So we've got one select board member, student liaison, member of the Lake Bill of Lake Cam slash community, or are we taking that out now? Lake Cam slash community. Okay. Library delegate and two members or three members at large? If the student isn't mm -hmm. voting, then we would need three members at large total. So that includes Lake Cam slash community. Right. Okay. So, so two. two. Yep. Two. Okay. One more time for the record, okay. Tracy. One select board member, student liaison, non-voting, a member of the Lake Camp slash community, a library delegate, and two at-large members. Yes. Thanks. My only, my recommendation, I love the thought that went into this, by the way, there's a lot of awesome stuff in here, and I, I'd like that you also identify that there could be some overlap with other groups, so you work with them. Um, I would be a little hesitant on defining the roles, though. I feel like that might make people a little intimidated. Like that's if, okay. Like if, if like say, say only event coordinator was open. Like, yeah. I can't plan an event for the life of me, so I'd never apply. But because they'll have to vote their own chair, vote a vice chair. Um, no, that's fair. I want to keep the roles in, though, just because um, a committee like this, to me, needs direction. It's, it's not a job, but it is a job mm -hmm. because it's very, they're, they're very active things in order to make this, this, I get what you're saying. To make this subcommittee effective, it would need to be defined. You'd need to have one person in charge of social media, one person in charge of the community aspect, one person with all the volunteers because they're very, they're big tasks in a sense. So having, and then the diagram down in the bottom left, I figured that would be how they would communicate the most. Like the communication and the lead marketer would mostly, would mostly communicate with the event coordinator and then the community liaison. They would have less communication with the volunteer and outreach coordinator. So I feel like by specifying the tasks to be most effective, you'd get the person best for the job. It could be totally wrong. I really don't know. But this is just <laughs> my <laughs> thoughts. We're going to start somewhere. Right? <coughs> yeah. Yes. Go to start somewhere. Well, I'll take. I'll entertain a motion to, um, I guess, designate the community and community outreach subcommittee, um, and membership makeup. Did I say that? Like whatever I said for the IT. <laughs> <laughs> Just change it with that and advertise it as well. Right. Yes, we need to advertise it as well. Um, and I'd just like to remind everybody that we are designating subcommittees so that they would have to be posted um, and agendas and um, minutes. So um, you have to make sure that you have somebody to record your meetings and you can reach out to the select board's office. Okay. Who made the motion? We haven't yet. Oh, okay. haven't yet. Someone. So move that. Sure. Second. Um, so moved. All right. So, Maureen, so moved it. Second. Maureen seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none. Roll, please. Katie and I. Johnny, you aye. Carboni, aye. Indeed, aye. Stay aye. Okay. Mm -hmm. and the next meeting we'll have. Um, um, can I just touch on the policy? Because this one deals specifically with select board policies, and I'm struggling to do a makeup. So let me know what everyone, I have two select board members. I have a non-voting um, staff support member, which would be someone who would maintain a hard copy of all the policies and a, an online whatever. And then I have one community member um, because they're the ones that vote us in. So uh, if anyone has a suggestion on who else they'd like to see. But the support wouldn't necessarily be a voting member, correct? Right. Mm -hmm. Non-voting. Non-voting. Yeah. All right. Well, that's 
Yeah. Can so. you put that to paper? And then um, yep. we have a charge? Yeah, I just have it all. Yeah, I'm working, I have the charge and everything. I did put um, as part of the charge an annual review. Um, I don't necessarily know it has to be annually, but at least that gives us some place to start. Okay. So, you know. Yeah. So we'll just put Brenna's that back like on. looking at her beautiful no, document and my chicken scratch. <laughs> oh my! Mine's on the napkin and on my phone, and I'm like, I'm just gonna wait. And uh, all right, so the, later. So we'll do um, the next two um, the ninth. policy and this. This yep, at the next meeting. Yep. Okay. Okay. Our next select board meeting is September 9th, 5:30 here at the Lakeville um, Police Department. Um, and with that, any old, other old business? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to enter executive session pursuant to Mass General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 21A, Section 2, to conduct a contract negotiations with non-union personnel, specifically Council and Aging Director, Building Commissioner, Human Resource Director, Facilities Manager, and Department of Public Works Director not to return into open session. So moved. Second. Okay, 8.55 p.m. I have a motion to second discussion. Hearing none, all roll please. Fabian, aye. Thank you, aye. Carboni, aye. Candido, aye. aye. Thank you very much. Good night. Enter. Exit.